Chapter Twenty Two of The Imperialist by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Well, Winter said Octavius Milburn, I expect there's business in this for you. Mr. Milburn and Mr. Winter had met in the act of unlocking their boxes at the post office elgin had enjoyed postal delivery for several years but not so much as to induce men of business to abandon the post office box that had been the great convenience succeeding window inquiry in time the boxes would go but the habit of dropping in for your own noonday mail on the way home to dinner was deep-rooted and undoubtedly you got it earlier moreover it takes time to engender confidence in a postman when he is drawn from your midst and when you know perfectly well that he would otherwise be driving the mere watering cart or delivering the mere ice as he was last year looks like it responded mr winter cheerfully the boys have been round as usual i told them they'd better try another shop this time but they seemed to think the old reliable was good enough to go on with this exchange to any one in elgin would have been patently simple on that day there was only one serious topic in elgin and there could have been only one reference to business for walter winter the dominion had come up the day before with the announcement that mr robert farquharson who for an aggregate of eleven years had represented the liberals of south fox in the canadian house of commons had been compelled under medical advice to withdraw from public life the news was unexpected and there was rather a feeling among mr farquharson's local support in elgin that it shouldn't have come from toronto it will be gathered that horace williams as he himself acknowledged was wild the general feeling and to some extent mr williams's was appeased by the further information that mr farquharson had been obliged to go to toronto to see a specialist whose report he had naturally enough taken to party headquarters whence the dominion would get it as mr williams said by telephone or any quicker way there was williams it should be added was well ahead with the details as considerate as was consistent with public enterprise of the retiring member's malady its duration the date of the earliest symptoms and the growth of anxiety in mrs farquharson who had finally insisted and how right she was on the visit to the specialist upon which she had accompanied mr farquharson he sent round rawlins so that elgin was in possession of all the facts and walter winter who had every pretension to contest the seat again and every satisfaction that it wouldn't be against farquharson might naturally be expected to be taken up with them sufficiently to understand a man who slapped him on the shoulder in the post office with the remark i have quoted i guess they know what they're about returned mr milburn it's a bad knock for the grits old farquharson having to drop out he's getting up in years but he's got a great hold here he'll be a dead loss in votes to his party i always said our side wouldn't have a chance till the old man was out of the way mr winter twisted the watch chain across his protuberant waistcoat and his chin sank in reflective folds above his necktie above that again his nose drooped over his moustache and his eyelids over his eyes which sought the floor altogether he looked sunk like an overfed bird in deferential contemplation of what mr milburn was saying they've nobody to touch him certainly in either ability or experience he replied looking up to do it with a handsome air of concession now that martin's dead and jim fox come that howler over pink river they'll have their work cut out for them to find a man i hear fox takes it hard after all he's done for em not to get the nomination but they won't hear of it quite right too he's let too many people in over that concession of his to be popular even among his friends i suppose he has dropped anything there yourself no nor i 
when a thing gets to the boom stage i say let it alone even if there's gold in it and you've got a school of mines man to tell you so fox came out of it at the small end himself i expect but that doesn't help him any in the eyes of business men i hear said walter winter stroking his nose that old man parsons has come right over since the bosses in ottawa have put so much money on preference trade with the old country he says he was a liberal once and may be a liberal again but he doesn't see his way to voting to give his customers blankets cheaper than he can make them and he'll wait till the clouds roll by he won't be the only one either said milburn take my word for it they'll be dead sick and sorry over this imperial craze in a year's time every government that's taken it up the people won't have it the empire looks nice on the map but when it comes to practical politics their bread and butter's in the home industries there's a great principle at stake winter i must say i envy you standing up for it under such favorable conditions liberals like young and windle may talk big but when it comes to the ballot box you'll have the whole manufacturing interest of the place behind you and nobody the wiser it's a great thing to carry the standard on an issue above and beyond party politics it's a purer air my boy walter winter's nod confirmed the sagacity of this and appreciated the high-mindedness it was a parting nod mr winter had too much on hand that morning to waste time upon octavius milburn but it was full of the qualities that ensure the success of a man's relation with his fellows consideration was in it and understanding and that kind of geniality that offers itself on a plain business footing a commercial heartiness that has no nonsense about it he had half a dozen casual chats like this with mr milburn on his way up main street and his manner expanded in cordiality and respect with each as if his growing confidence in himself increased his confidence in his fellow men the same assurance greeted him several times over every friend wanted to remind him of the enemy's exigency and to assure him that the enemy's new policy was enough by itself to bring him romping in at last and to every assurance he presented the same acceptable attitude of desiring for particular reasons to take special note of such valuable views at the end he had neither elicited nor imparted a single opinion of any importance nevertheless he was quite entitled to his glow of satisfaction among mr winter's qualifications for political life was his capacity to arrive at an estimate of the position of the enemy he was never persuaded to his own advantage he never stepped ahead of the facts it was one of the things that made him popular with the other side his readiness to do justice to their equipment to acknowledge their chances there is gratification of a special sort in hearing your points of vantage confessed by the foe the vanity is soothed by his open admission that you are worthy of his steel it makes you a little less keen somehow about defeating him it may be that mr winter had an instinct for this or perhaps he thought such discourse more profitable if less pleasant than derisive talk in the opposite sense at all events he gained something and lost nothing by it even in his own camp where swagger might be expected to breed admiration he was thought a level-headed fellow who didn't expect miracles his forecast in most matters was quoted and his defeat at the polls had been to some extent neutralized by his sagacity in computing the returns in advance so that we may safely follow mr winter to the conclusion that the liberals of south fox were somewhat put to it to select a successor to robert farquharson who could be depended upon to keep the party credit exactly where he found it the need was unexpected and the two men who would have stepped most naturally into farquharson's shoes 
were disqualified as winter described the retirement came at a calculating moment south fox still declared itself with pride an unhealthy division for conservatives but new considerations had thrust themselves among liberal councils and nobody yet knew what the country would say to them the place was a grit stronghold but its steady growth as an industrial centre would give a new significance to the figures of the next returns the conservative was the manufacturer's party and had been ever since the veteran sir john macdonald declared for a protective national policy and placed the plain issue before the country which divided the industrial and the agricultural interests a certain number of mill owners mr milburn mentioned young and windle belonged to the liberals as if to illustrate the fact that you inherit your party in canada as you inherit your denomination or your nose it accompanies you simply to the grave but they were exceptions and there was no doubt that the other side had been considerably strengthened by the addition of two or three thriving and highly capitalized concerns during the past five years upon the top of this had come the possibility of a great and dramatic change of trade relations with great britain which the liberal government at ottawa had given every sign of willingness to adopt had indeed initiated and were bound by word and letter to follow up though the moment had not yet come might never come for its acceptance or rejection by the country as a whole there could be no doubt that every by-election would be concerned with the policy involved and that every liberal candidate must be prepared to stand by it in so far as the leaders had conceived and pushed it party feeling was by no means unanimous in favor of the change many liberals saw commercial salvation closer in improved trade relations with the united states on the other hand the new policy clothed as it was in the attractive sentiment of loyalty and making for the solidarity of the british race might be depended upon to capture votes which had been hitherto conservative mainly because these professions were supposed to be an indissoluble part of conservatism it was a thing to split the vote sufficiently to bring an unusual amount of anxiety and calculation into liberal councils the other side were in no doubt or difficulty walter winter was good enough for them and it was their cheerful conviction that walter winter would put a large number of people wise on the subject of preference trade by and by who at present only knew enough to vote for it the great question was the practicability of the new idea and how much further it could safely be carried in a loyal dominion which was just getting on its industrial legs it was debated with anxiety at ottawa and made the subject of special instruction to south fox where the by-election would have all the importance of an early test it's a clear issue wrote an influential person at ottawa to the local party leaders at elgin we don't want any tendency to hedge or double it's straight business with us the thing we want and it will be till wallingham either gets it through over there or finds he can't deal with us meanwhile it might be as well to ascertain just how much there is in it for platform purposes in a safe spot like south fox the objection to carter is that he's only half convinced he couldn't talk straight if he wanted to and that lecture tour of his in the united states ten years ago pushing reciprocity with the americans would make awkward literature the rejection of carter practically exhausted the list of men available whose standing in the town and experience of its suffrages brought them naturally into the field of selection and at this point cruikshank wrote to farquharson suggesting the dramatic departure involved in the name of lorne murchison cruikshank wrote judiciously leaving the main arguments in lorne's favor to form themselves in farquharson's mind 
but countering the objections that would rise there by the suggestion that after a long period of confidence and steady going in fact of the orthodox and expected the party should profit by the swing of the pendulum toward novelty and tentative rather than bring forward a candidate who would represent possibly misrepresent the same beliefs and intentions on a lower personal level as there was no first-rate man of the same sort to succeed farquharson cruikshank suggested the undesirability of a second-rate man and he did it so adroitly that the old fellow found himself in a good deal of sympathy with the idea he had small opinion of the lot that was left for selection and smaller relish for the prospect of turning his honourable activity over to any one of them force of habit and training made him smile at cruikshank's proposition as impracticable but he felt its attraction even while he dismissed it to an inside pocket young murchison's name would be so unlooked for that if he farquharson could succeed in imposing it upon the party it would be almost like making a personal choice of his successor a grateful idea in abdication farquharson wished regretfully that lorne had another five years to his credit in the liberal record of south fox by the time the young fellow had earned them he the retiring member would be quite on the shelf if in no completer oblivion he could not expect much of a voice in any nomination five years hence he sighed to think of it it was at that point of his meditations that mr farquharson met squire ormiston on the steps of the bank of british north america an old-fashioned building with an appearance of dignity and probity a look of having been founded long ago upon principles which raised it above fluctuation exactly the place in which mr farquharson and squire ormiston might be expected to meet the two men though politically opposed were excellent friends they greeted cordially so you're ordered out of politics farquharson said the squire we are all sorry for that you know i'm afraid so i'm afraid so thanks for your letter very friendly of you squire i don't like it no use pretending i do but it seems i've got to take a rest if i want to be known as a going concern a fellow with so much influence in committee ought to have more control of his nerve centres ormiston told him the squire belonged to that order of elderly gentlemen who will have their little joke well have you and bingham and horace williams made up your minds who's to have the seat farquharson shook his head i only know what i see in the papers he said the dominion is a way out with fox and the express is about as lukewarm with carter as he is with federated trade your government won't be obliged to you for carter said mr ormiston a more slack-kneed double-jointed scoundrel was never offered a commission in a respectable cause he'll be the first to rat if things begin to look queer for this new policy of yours and wallingham's he hasn't got it yet farquharson admitted and he won't with my good will so you're with us for preference trade ormiston it's a thing i'd like to see it's a thing i'm sorry we're not in a position to take up practically ourselves but you won't get it you know you'll be defeated by the senior partner it's too much of a doctrine for the people of england they're listening to wallingham just now because they admire him but they won't listen to you i doubt whether it will ever come to an issue over there this time next year wallingham will be sucking his thumbs and thinking of something else no it's not a thing to worry about politically for it won't come through the squire's words suggested so much relief in that conviction that farquharson sharp on the flare of the experienced nose for waverers looked at him observantly i'm not so sure it's a doctrine with a fine practical application for them as well as for us if they can be got to see it and they're bound to see it in time 
it's a thing i never expected to live to believe never thought would be practicable until lately but now i think there's a very good chance of it and hang it all he added it may be unreasonable but the more i notice the yankees making propositions to get us away from it the more i want to see it come through i have very much the same feeling the squire acknowledged i've been turning the matter over a good deal since that last conference showed which way the wind was blowing and the fellows in your government gave them a fine lead but such a proposition was bound to come from your side the whole political history of the country shows it we're pledged to take care of the damned industries farquharson smiled at the note of depression well we want a bigger market somewhere he said with detachment and it looks as if we could get it now uncle sam has had a fright if the question comes to be fought out at the polls i don't see how your party could do better than go in for a wide scheme of reciprocity with the americans in raw products of course with a tariff to match theirs on manufactured goods that would shut a pretty tight door on british connection though they'll not get my vote if they do said the squire thrusting his hands fiercely into his breeches pockets as you say it's most important to put up a man who will show the constituency all the credit and benefit there is in it anyhow farquharson observed i've had a letter this morning he added laughing from a fellow one of the bosses too who wants us to nominate young murchison the lawyer that's the man he's too young of course not thirty but he's well known in the country districts i don't know a man of his age with a more useful service record he's got a lot of friends and he's come a good deal to the front lately through that inter-imperial communications business we might do worse and upon my word we're in such a hole farquharson said old squire ormiston the red creeping over features that had not lost in three generations the lines of the old breed i've voted in the conservative interest for forty years and my father before me we were whigs when we settled in massachusetts and whigs when we pulled up stakes and came north rather than take up arms against the king but it seemed decent to support the government that gave us a chance again under the flag and my grandfather changed his politics now confound it the flag seems to be with the whigs again for fighting purposes anyhow and i don't seem to have any choice i've been debating the thing for some time now and your talk of making that fine young fellow your candidate settles it if you can get your committee to accept young murchison you can count on my vote and i don't want to brag but i think you can count on maneda too though it's never sent in a grit majority yet the men were standing on the steps of the bank and the crisp air of autumn brought them both an agreeable tingle of enterprise farquharson's buggy was tied to the nearest maple i'm going over to east elgin to look at my brick kilns he said get in with me will you as they drove up main street they encountered walter winter who looked after them with a deeply considering eye old armiston always had the imperial bee in his bonnet said he End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary alfred hesketh was among the first to hear of lorne's nomination to represent the constituency of south fox in the dominion parliament the milburns told him it was dora who actually made the communication the occasion was high tea miss milburn's apprehension about englishmen and late dinner had been dissipated in great amusement 
mr hesketh liked nothing better than high tea liked nothing so much he came often to the milburns after mrs milburn said she hoped he would and pleased her extremely by the alacrity with which he accepted her first invitation to stay to what she described as their very simple and unconventional meal later he won her approval entirely by saying boldly that he hoped he was going to be allowed to stay it was only in good english society mrs milburn declared that you found such freedom and confidence it reminded her of mrs emmet's saying that her sister-in-law in in london was always at home to lunch mrs milburn considered a vague project of informing a select number of her acquaintances that she was always at home to high tea but on reflection dismissed it in case an inconvenient number should come at once she would never have gone into detail but since a tin of sardines will only hold so many i may say for her that it was the part of wisdom mr hesketh however wore the safe and attractive aspect of a single exceptional instance there were always sardines enough for him it will be imagined what pleasure mrs milburn and miss filkin took in his visits how he propped up their standard of behaviour in all things unessential which was too likely to be growing limp so far from approved examples i think it was a real aesthetic satisfaction i know they would talk of it afterward for hours with sighing comparisons of the form of the young men of elgin which they called beside hesketh's quite outre it was a favorite word with mrs milburn outre she used it like a lorgnette and felt her familiarity with it a differentiating mark mr milburn never so susceptible to delicate distinctions looked upon the young englishman with benevolent neutrality dora wished it to be understood that she reserved her opinion he might be all that he seemed and again he might not englishmen were so deep they might have nice manners but they didn't always act up to them so far as she had noticed there was that honourable somebody who was in jail even then for trying to borrow money under false pretences from the governor-general lorne when she expressed these views to him reassured her but she continued to maintain a guarded attitude upon mr hesketh to everybody except mr hesketh himself it was dora as i have said who imparted the news lorne had come over with it in the afternoon still a little dazed and unbelieving in the face of his tremendous luck helped by finding her so readily credulous to thinking it reasonably possible himself he could not have done better than come to dora for a correction of any undue exultation that he might have felt however she supplied it in ten minutes by reminding him of their wisdom in keeping the secret of their relations his engagement to the daughter of a prominent conservative would not indeed have told in his favour with his party to say nothing of the anomaly of mr milburn's unyielding opposition to the new policy i never knew father so nearly bitter about anything dora said a statement which left her lover thoughtful but undaunted we'll bring him round said lorne when he sees that the british manufacturer can't possibly get the better of men on the spot who know to a nut the local requirements to which she had responded oh lorne don't begin that again and he had gone away hot foot for the first step of preparation it's exactly what i should have expected said hesketh when she told him murchison is the very man they want he's cut out for a political success i saw that when he was in england you haven't been very long in the country mr hesketh or we shouldn't hear you saying that said mr milburn amicably it's a very remarkable thing with us a political party putting forward so young a man now with you i expect a young fellow might get in on his rank or his wealth 
your principle of non-payment of members confines your selection more or less i don't say you're not right but over here we do pay you see and it makes a lot of difference in the competition it isn't a greater honor but it's more sought for i expect there'll be a good many sore heads over this business it's all the more creditable to murchison said hesketh of course it is a great feather in his cap oh i don't say young murchison isn't a rising fellow but it's foolishness for his party i can't think who is responsible for it however they've got a pretty foolish platform just now they couldn't win this seat on it with any man a lesson will be good for them father don't you think lorne will get in asked dora in a tone of injury and slight resentment not by a handful said her father mr walter winter will represent south fox in the next session of parliament if you ask my opinion but father returned his daughter with an outraged inflection you'll vote for lorne a smile went round the table discreetest in mrs milburn i'm afraid not said mr milburn i'm afraid not sorry to disoblige but principles are principles dora perceptibly pouted mrs milburn created a diversion with greengage preserves under cover of it hesketh asked is he a great friend of yours one of my very greatest dora replied i know he'll expect father to vote for him it makes it awfully embarrassing for me oh i fancy he'll understand said hesketh easily political convictions are serious things you know friendship isn't supposed to interfere with them i wonder he went on meditatively whether i could be of any use to murchison now that i've made up my mind to stop till after christmas i'll be on hand for the fight i've had some experience i used to canvass now and then from oxford it was always a tremendous lark oh mr hesketh do really and truly he is one of my oldest friends and i should love to see him get in i know his sister too they're a very clever family quite self-made you know but highly respected promise me you will i promise with pleasure and i wish it were something it would give me more trouble to perform i like murchison said hesketh all this transpiring while they were supposed to be eating greengage preserves and mrs milburn and miss filkin endeavoured to engage the head of the house in the kind of easy allusion to affairs of the moment to which mr hesketh would be accustomed as a form of conversation the accident to the german empress the marriage of one of the rothschilds the ladies were compelled to supply most of the facts and all of the interest but they kept up a gallant line of attack and the young man taking gratified possession of dora's eyes was extremely obliged to them hesketh lost no time in communicating his willingness to be of use to murchison and lorn felt all his old friendliness rise up in him as he cordially accepted the offer it was made with british heartiness it was thoroughly meant lorne was half ashamed in his recognition of its quality a certain aloofness had grown in him against his will since hesketh had prolonged his stay in the town difficult to justify impossible to define hesketh as hesketh was worthily admirable as ever wholesome and agreeable as well turned out by his conscience as he was by his tailor it was hesketh in his relation to his new environment that seemed vaguely to come short this in spite of an enthusiasm which was genuine enough he found plenty of things to like about the country it was perhaps in some manifestation of sensitiveness that he failed he had the adaptability of the pioneer among rugged conditions but he could not mingle quite immediately with the essence of them he did not perceive the genius loci lorne had been conscious of this as a kind of undefined grievance 
now he specified it and put it down to hesketh's isolation among ways that were different from the ways he knew you were bound to notice that hesketh as a stranger had his own point of view his own training to retreat upon i certainly liked him better over there lorne told at vina but then he was a part of it he wasn't separated out as he is here he was just one sort of fellow that you admired and there were lots of sorts that you admired more over here you seem to see round him somehow i shouldn't have thought it difficult said his sister besides lorne confessed i expect it was easier to like him when you were inclined to like everybody a person feels more critical of a visitor especially when he's had advantages he added honestly i expect we don't care about having to acknowledge em so very much that's what it comes to i don't see them said edvina mr hesketh seems well enough in his way fairly intelligent and anxious to be pleasant but i can't say i find him a specially interesting or valuable type interesting you wouldn't but valuable well you see you haven't been in england you haven't seen them over there crowds of em piling up the national character hesketh's an average and for an average he's high oh he's a good sort and he just smells of england he seems all right in his politics said john murchison filling his pipe from the tobacco jar on the mantelpiece but i doubt whether you'll find him much assistance the way he talks of folks over here know their own business they've had to learn it i doubt if they'll take showing from hesketh they might be a good deal worse advised that may be said mr murchison and settled down in his armchair behind the dominion i agree with father said edvina he won't be any good lorne edvina prefers scotch remarked stella i don't know he's full of the subject said lorne he can present it from the other side the side of the british exporter inquired his father looking over the top of the dominion with unexpected humour no sir though there are places where we might talk cheap overcoats and tablecloths and a few odds and ends like that the side of the all british loaf and the lot of people there are to eat it said lorne that ought to make a friendly feeling and if there's anything in the sentiment of the scheme he added it shouldn't do any harm to have a good specimen of the english people advocating it hesketh ought to be an object lesson i wouldn't put too much faith in the object lesson said john murchison neither would i said stella emphatically mr alfred hesketh may pass in an english crowd but over here he's just an ignorant young man and you'd better not have him talking with his mouth at any of your meetings tell him to go and play with walter winter i heard he was asking at volunteer headquarters the other night remarked alec how long it would be before a man like himself if he threw in his lot with the country could expect to get nominated for a provincial seat what did they tell him asked mr murchison when they had finished their laugh i heard they said it would depend a good deal on the size of the lot and a little on the size of the man remarked edvina he said he would be willing to take a seat in a legislature and work up alec went on ontario for choice because he thought the people of this province more advanced there's a representative committee being formed to give the inhabitants of the poorhouse a turkey dinner on thanksgiving day said edvina he might begin with that i dare say he would if anybody told him he's just dying to be taken into the public service alec said he's in dead earnest about it he thinks this country's a great place because it gives a man the chance of a public career why is it asked edvina that when people have no capacity for private usefulness they should be so anxious to serve the public 
oh come said lorn hesketh has an income of his own why should he sweat for his living we needn't pride ourselves on being so taken up with getting ours a man like that is in a position to do some good and i hope hesketh will get a chance if he stays over here we'll soon see how he speaks he's going to follow farquharson at jordanville on thursday week i wonder at farquharson said his father by this time the candidature of mr lorne murchison was well in the public eye the express announced it in a burst of beaming headlines with a biographical sketch and a cut of its young fellow townsman horace williams whose hand was plain in every line apologized for the brevity of the biography quality rather than quantity he said it was all good and time would make it better this did not prevent the mercury observing the next evening that the liberal organ had omitted to state the age at which the new candidate was weaned the toronto papers commented according to their party bias but so far as the candidate was concerned there was lack of the material of criticism if he had achieved little for praise he had achieved nothing for detraction there was no inconsistent public utterance no doubtful transaction no scandalous paper to bring forward to his detriment when the fact that he was but twenty-eight years of age had been exhausted in elaborate ridicule little more was available the policy he championed however lent itself to the widest discussion and it was instructive to note how the opposition press while continuing to approve the great principle involved found material for gravest criticism in the government's projected application of it interest increased in the south fox by election as its first touchstone and gathered almost romantically about lorne murchison as its spirited advocate it was commonly said that whether he was returned or not on this occasion his political future was assured and his name was carried up and down the dominion with every new wind of imperial doctrine that blew across the atlantic he himself felt splendidly that he rode upon the crest of a wave of history however the event appeared which was hidden beyond the horizon the great luck of that buoyant emotion of that thrilling suspense would be his in a very special way he was exhilarated by the sense of crisis and among all the conferences and calculations that armed him for his personal struggle he would now and then breathe in his private soul choose quickly england like a prayer elgin rose to its liking for the fellow and even his political enemies felt a half humorous pride that the town had produced a candidate whose natural parts were held to eclipse the age and experience of party hacks plenty of them were found to declare that lord murchison would poll more votes for the grits than any other man they could lay their hands on with the saving clause that neither he nor any other man could poll quite enough this time they professed to be content to let the issue have it meanwhile they congratulated lorne on his chance telling him that a knock or two wouldn't do him any harm at his age walter winter who hadn't been on speaking terms with farquharson made a point of shaking hands with murchison in the publicity of the post office and assuring him that he winter never went into a contest more confident of the straight thing on the part of the other side such cavilling as there was came from the organized support of his own party and had little importance because it did the grumblers fell into line almost as soon as horace williams said they would a little oil one small appointment wrung from the ontario government fox i believe got it and the machine was again in good working order lorne even profited in the opinion of many by the fact of his youth with its promise of energy and initiative since mr farquharson had lately been showing the defects as well as the qualities of age and experience and the charge of servile timidity was already in the mouths of his critics the agricultural community took it as usual with phlegm 
but there was a distinct tendency in the bar at barker's on market days to lay money on the colt end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary mr farquharson was to retain his seat until the early spring for the double purpose of maintaining his influence upon an important commission of which he was chairman until the work should be done and of giving the imperial departure championed by his successor as good a chance as possible of becoming understood in the constituency it was understood that the new writ would issue for a date in march elgin referred all interest to that point and prophesied for itself a lively winter another event of importance less general was arranged for the end of february the arrival of miss cameron and mrs kilbannon from scotland finlay had proposed an earlier date but matters of business connected with her mother's estate would delay miss cameron's departure her arrival would be the decisive point of another campaign he and edwina faced it without misgiving but there were moments when finlay greatly wished the moment passed their intimacy had never been conspicuous and their determination to make no change in it could be carried out without attracting attention it was very dear to them that determination they saw it as a test as an ideal last of all perhaps as an alleviation they were both too much encumbered with ideas to move simply quickly on the impulse of passion they looked at it through the wrong end of the glass and thought they put it farther away they believed that their relation comprised would always comprise the best of life it was matter for discussion singularly attractive they allowed themselves upon it wide scope in theory they could speak of it in the heroic temper without sadness or bitterness the thing was to tear away the veil and look fate in the face the great thing perhaps was to speak of it while still they could give themselves leave a day would arrive they acknowledged with averted eyes when dumbness would be more becoming meanwhile mrs murchison would have found it hard to sustain her charge against them that they talked of nothing but books and authors the philosophy of life as they were intensely creating it was more entrancing than any book or any author simply and definitely and to their own satisfaction they had abandoned the natural demands of their state they lived in its exaltation and were far from accidents deep in both of them was a kind of protective nobility i will not say it cost them nothing but it turned the scenes between them into comedy of the better sort the kind that deserves the relief of stone or bronze Advina, had she heard it would have repelled dr drummond's warning with indignation if it were so possible to keep their friendship on an unfaltering level then with the latitude they had what danger could attend them later when the social law would support them divide them protect them dr drummond suspecting all looked grimly on and from november to march found no need to invite mr finlay to occupy the pulpit of knox church they had come to full knowledge that night of their long walk in the dark together but even then in the rush and shock and glory of it they had held apart and their broken avowals had crossed with difficulty from one to the other the whole fabric of circumstance was between them to realize and to explore later surveys as we know had not reduced it they gave it great credit as a barrier i suppose because it kept them out of each other's arms it had done that it was edwina i fear who insisted most that they should continue upon terms of happy debt to one another the balance always changing the account never closed and rendered 
she no doubt felt that she might impose the terms she had unconsciously the sense of greater sacrifice and knew that she had been mistress of the situation long before he was aware of it he agreed with joy and with misgiving he saw with enthusiasm her high conception of their alliance but sometimes wondered poor fellow whether he was right in letting it cover him he came to the house as he had done before as often as he could and reproached himself that he could not after all come very often that they should discuss their relation as candidly as they sustained it was perhaps a little peculiar to them so i have laid stress on it but it was not by any means their sole preoccupation they talked like tried friends of their everyday affairs indeed after the trouble and intoxication of their great understanding had spent itself it was the small practical interests of life that seemed to hold them most one might think that nature having made them her invitation upon the higher plane abandoned them in the very scorn of her success to the warm human commonplaces that do her work well enough with the common type mrs murchison would have thought better of them if she had chanced again to overhear i wouldn't advise you to have it lined with fur edvina was saying the winter had sharply announced itself and finley to her reproach about his light overcoat had declared his intention of ordering a buffalo skin the following day and the buffaloes are all gone you know thirty years ago she laughed you really are not modern in practical matters does it ever surprise you that you get no pemmican for dinner and hardly ever meet an indian in his feathers he looked at her with delight in his sombre eyes it was a new discovery her capacity for happily chaffing him only revealed since she had come out of her bonds to love it was hard to say which of them took the greater pleasure in it what is the use of living in canada if you can't have fur on your clothes he demanded you may have a little astrakhan i would on the collar and cuffs she said a fur lining is too hot if there happens to be a thaw and then you would leave it off and take cold you have all the look she added with a gravely considering glance at him of a person who ought to take care of his chest he withdrew his eyes hurriedly and fixed them instead on his pipe he always brought it with him by her order and edvina usually sewed he thought as he watched her that it made the silences enjoyable and expensive i dare say too he said yes more or less alec paid fifty dollars for his and never liked it fifty dollars ten pounds no vere for me he declared by the way mrs Furman is threatening to turn me out of house and home a married daughter is coming to live with her and she wants my rooms when does she come the married daughter oh not till the early spring there's no immediate despair said finlay but it is dislocating my books and i had just succeeded in making room for one another but you will have to move in any case in the early spring i suppose i will i had i might have remembered that have you found a house yet edvina asked him no have you been looking it was a gentle sensible reminder i am afraid i haven't he moved in his chair as if in physical discomfort do you think i ought so soon there are always plenty of houses aren't there not plenty of desirable ones do you think you must live in east elgin it would be rather more convenient because there are two semi-detached in river street just finished that look very pretty and roomy i thought when i saw them that one of them might be what you would like thank you he said and tried not to say it curtly they belong to white the grocer river street isn't east elgin but it is that way and it would be a great deal pleasanter for for her 
i must consider that of course you haven't been in them i should hope for a bright sitting-room and a very private study if edvina was aware of any unconscious implication the pair of eyes she turned upon him showed no trace of satisfaction in it no i haven't but if i could be of any use i should be very glad to go over them with you and she stopped involuntarily checked by the embarrassment in his face though she had to wait for his words to explain it i should be most grateful but but might it not be misunderstood she bent her head over her work and one of those instants passed between them which he had learned to dread they were so completely the human pair as they sat together withdrawn in comfort and shelter absorbed in homely matters and in each other it was easy to forget that they were only a picture a sham and that the reality lay further on in the early spring it must have been hard for him to hear without resentment that she was ready to help him to make a home for that reality he was fast growing instructed in women although by a postgraduate course edvina looked up possibly she said calmly and their agitation lay still between them he was silently angry the thing that stirred without their leave had been sweet no said edvina i can't go i suppose i'm sorry i should have liked so much to be of use she looked up at him appealingly and sudden tears came and stood in her eyes and would perhaps have undone his hurt but that he was staring into the fire how can you be of use he said almost irritably in such ways as those they are not important and i am not sure that for us they are legitimate if you were about to be married he seemed to plunge at the word i should not wish either to hasten you or to house you i should turn my back on it all you should have nothing from me he went on with a forced smile but my blessing delivered over my shoulder i am sure they are not important she said humbly privately all unwilling to give up her martyrdom but surely they are legitimate i would like to help you in every little way i can don't you like me in your life you have said that i may stay i believe you think that by taking strong measures one can exorcise things he said that if we could only write out this history of ours in our heart's blood it would somehow vanish no she said but i should like to do it all the same you must bear with me if i refuse the heroic in little it is even harder than the other he broke off leaning back and looking at her from under his shading hand as if that might protect him from too complete a vision the firelight was warm on her cheek and hair her needle once again completed the dear delusion she sat there his wife this was an aspect he forbade but it would return here it was again it is good to have you in my life he said it is also good to recognize one's possibilities how can you definitely lose me she asked and he shook his head i don't know now that i have found you it is as if you and i had been rocked together on the tide of that inconceivable ocean that casts us half awake upon life he said dreamily it isn't friendship of ideas it's a friendship of spirit indeed i hope and pray never wholly to lose that you never will she told him how many worlds one lives in as the day goes by with the different people one cares for one beyond the other concentric ringing from the heart yours comprises all the others it lies the farthest out and alas at present the closest in she added irresistibly to the asking of his eyes but she hurried on taking high ground to remedy her indiscretion i look forward to the time when this 
other feeling of ours will become just an idea as it is now just an emotion at which we should try to smile it is the attitude of the gods and therefore not becoming to men why should we not being gods borrow their attitude said finlay i could never kill it she put her work in her lap to say by any sudden act of violence it would seem a kind of suicide while it rules it is like one's life absolute but to isolate it to place it beyond the currents from the heart to look at it and realize it and conquer it for what it is i don't think it need take so very long and then our friendship will be beautiful without reproach i sometimes fear there may not be time enough in life he said and if i find that i must simply go to british columbia i think those mining missions would give a man his chance against himself there is splendid work to be done there of a rough and ready kind that would make it puerile to spend time in self-questioning she smiled as if at a violent boy we can do it we can do it here she said may i quote another religion to you from purification there arises in the yogi a thorough discernment of the cause and nature of the body whereupon he loses that regard which others have for the bodily form then if he loves he loves in spirit and in truth i look forward to the time she went on calmly when the best that i can give you or you can give me will ride upon a glance i used to feel more drawn to the ascetic achievement and its rewards he remarked thoughtfully than i do now if i were not a presbyterian in canada she told him i would be a buddhist in burma but i have inherited the shorter catechism i must remain without the law finlay smiled they are the simple he said our law makes wise the simple edwina looked for a moment into the fire she was listening with admiration to her heart she would not be led to consider esoteric contrasts of east and west isn't there something that appeals to you she said in the thought of just leaving it all unsaid and all undone a dear and tender projection upon the future that faded a lovely thing we turned away from until one day it was no longer there charming he said averting his eyes so that she should not see the hunger in them charming literature she smiled and sighed and he wrenched his mind to the consideration of the buddhism of browning she followed him obediently but the lines they wanted did not come easily they were compelled to search and verify something lately seemed lost to them of that kind of glad activity he was more aware of it than she since he was less occupied in the aesthetic ecstasy of self-torture in the old time before the sun rose they had been so conscious of realms of idea lying just beyond the achievement of thought approachable visible by phrases brokenly realms which they could see closer when they essayed together he constantly struggled to reach those enchanted areas again but they seemed to have gone down behind the horizon and the only inspiration that carried them far drew its impetus from the poetry of their plight they looked for verses to prove that browning's imagination carried him bravely through lives and lives to come and found them to speculate whether in such chances they might hope to meet again and the talk came back to his difficulties with his board of management and to her choice of a frame for the etching he had given her by his friend the glasgow impressionist and to their opinion of a common acquaintance and to lorne and his prospects 
he told her how little she resembled her brother and where they diverged and how and she listened with submission and delight enchanted to feel his hand upon her intimate nature she lingered in the hall while he got into his overcoat and saw that a glove was the worse for wear would it be the heroic in little she begged to let me mend that as he went out alone into the winter streets he too drew upon a pagan for his admonition what then art thou doing here o imagination he groaned in his private heart go away i entreat thee by the gods for i want thee not but thou art come again according to thy old fashion i am not angry with thee only go away End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of the imperialists by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary miss milburn pressed her contention that the suspicion of his desire would be bad for her lover's political prospects till she made him feel his honest passion almost a form of treachery to his party she also hinted that for the time being it did not make particularly for her own comfort in the family circle mr milburn having grown by this time quite bitter she herself drew the excitement of intrigue from the situation which she hid behind her pretty pale decorous features and never betrayed by the least of her graceful gestures she told herself that she had never been so right about anything as about that affair of the ring imagine for an instant if she had been wearing it now she would have banished lorne altogether if she could as he insisted on an occasional meeting she clothed it in mystery appointing it for an evening when her mother and aunt were out and answering his ring at the door herself to her family she remarked with detachment that she saw hardly anything of lorne murchison now he was so taken up with his old election and to hesketh she confided her fear that politics did interfere with friendship whatever he might say he said a good deal he cited lofty examples but the only agreement he could get from her was the hope that the estrangement wouldn't be permanent but you are going to say something lorne she insisted talking of the jordanville meeting not much he told her it's the safest district we've got and they adore old farquharson he'll do most of the talking they wouldn't thank me for taking up the time farquharson is going to tell them i'm a first-class man and they couldn't do better and i've practically only to show my face and tell them i think so too but mr hesketh will speak yes we thought it would be a good chance of testing him he may interest them and he can't do much harm anyhow lorne i should simply love to go it's your first meeting i'll take you mr murchison have you taken leave of your senses really you are all right i'll send you farquharson and i are going out to the crow place to supper but hesketh is driving straight there he'll be delighted to bring you who wouldn't i shouldn't be allowed to go with him alone said dora thoughtfully well no i don't know that i'd approve of that myself laughed the confident young man hesketh is driving mrs farquharson and the cutter will easily hold three isn't it lucky there's slaying mother couldn't object to that said dora lorne i always said you were the dearest fellow i'll wear a thick veil and not a soul will know me not a soul would in any case said lorne it'll be a jordanville crowd you know nobody from elgin we don't visit much in jordanville certainly well mother mayn't object she has a great idea of mrs farquharson because she has attended eleven drawing-rooms at ottawa and one of them was given held i should say by the princess louise 
i won't promise you eleven said lorne but there seems to be a pretty fair chance of one or two at this she had a tale for him which charmed his ears i didn't know where to look she said aunt emmy you know has a very bad trick of coming into my room without knocking well in she walked last night and found me before the glass practising my curtsy i could have killed her pretended she thought i was out dora would you like me to promise something he asked with a mischievous look of course i would i don't care how much you promise what but already he repented of his daring and sat beside her suddenly conscious and abashed nor could any teasing prevail to draw from him what had been on his audacious lips to say social precedents are easily established in the country the accident that sent the first liberal canvasser for jordanville votes to the crow place for his supper would be hard to discover now the fact remains that he has been going there ever since it made a greater occasion than mrs crow would ever have dreamed of acknowledging she saw to it that they had a good meal of victuals and affected indifference to the rest they must say their say she supposed if the occasion had one satisfaction which she came nearer to confessing than another it was that the two or three substantial neighbors who usually came to meet the politicians left their wives at home and that she herself to avoid giving any offence on this score never sat down with the men quite enough to do it was she would explain later for her and the hired girl to wait on them and to clear up after them she and bella had their bite afterward when the men had hitched up and when they could exchange comments of proud congratulation upon the inroads on the johnny cake or the pies so there was no ill-feeling and mrs crow having vindicated her dignity by shaking hands with the guests of the evening in the parlor solaced it further by maintaining the masculine state of the occasion in spite of protests or entreaties to sit down opposite mr crow would have made it ordinary company she passed the plates and turned it into a function she was waiting for them on the parlor sofa when crow brought them in out of the nipping early dark of december elmore staying behind in the yard with the horses she sat on the sofa in her best black dress with the bead trimming on the neck and sleeves a good deal pushed up and wrinkled across the bosom which had done all that would ever be required of it when it gave elmore and abe their start in life her wiry hands were crossed in her lap in the moment of waiting you could tell by the look of them that they were not often crossed there they were strenuous hands the whole worn figure was strenuous and the narrow set mouth and the eyes which had looked after so many matters for so long and even the way the hair was drawn back into a knot in a fashion that would have given a phrenologist his opportunity it was a different mrs crow from the one that sat in the midst of her poultry and garden stuff in the elgin market square but it was even more the same mrs crow the sum of a certain measure of opportunity and service an imperial figure in her bead trimming if the truth were known the room was heated to express the geniality that was harder to put in words the window was shut there was a smell of varnish and whatever was inside the suite of which mrs crow occupied the sofa enlarged photographs very much enlarged of mr and mrs crow hung upon the walls and one other of a young girl done in that process which tells you at once that she was an only daughter and that she is dead there had been other bereavements they were written upon the silver coffin plates which framed and glazed also contributed to the decoration of the room but you would have had to look close and you might feel a delicacy mrs crow made her greetings with precision and sat down again upon the sofa for a few minutes conversation i'm telling them said her husband that the slayin's just held out for them if it had been to-morrow they'd have had to come on wheels pretty soft travelin as it was some places i guess 
snows come early this year said mrs crow it was an open fall too it has certainly mr farquharson backed her up about as early as i remember it i don't know how much you got out here we had a good foot in elgin about the same about the same mr crow deliberated but it's been layin light all along over clayfield way ain't had a pair of runners out them folks makes a more cheerful winter mrs crow don't you think when it comes early remarked lorne or would you rather not get it till after christmas i don't know as it matters much out here in the country we don't get a great many folks passin best o times and it's more of a job to take care of the stock that's so mr crow told them chores come heavier when there's snow on the ground a great sight especially if there's drifts and for an instant with his knotted hands hanging between his knees he pondered this unvarying aspect of his yearly experience they all pondered it sympathetic well now mr farquharson mrs crow turned to him and how really be ye we've heard better and worse and middlin there's been such contradictory reports oh very well mrs crow never better i'm going to give a lot more trouble yet i can't do it in politics that's the worst of it but here's the man that's going to do it for me here's the man the crows looked at the pretendant as in duty bound but not any longer than they could help why i guess you were at school with elmore said crow as if the idea had just struck him he may be right pert for all that said elmore's mother and elmore himself entering with two leading liberals of jordanville effected a diversion under cover of which mrs crow escaped to superintend with bella the last touches to the supper in the kitchen politics in and about jordanville were accepted as a purely masculine interest if you had asked mrs crow to take a hand in them she would have thanked you with sarcasm and said she thought she had about enough to do as it was the schoolhouse on the night of such a meeting as this was recognized to be no place for ladies it was a man's affair left to the men and the appearance there of the other sex would have been greeted with remark and levity elgin as we know was more sophisticated in every way plenty of ladies attended political meetings in the drill shed where seats as likely as not would be reserved for them plenty of handkerchiefs waved there for the encouragement of the hero of the evening they did not kiss him british phlegm so far had stayed that demonstration at the southern border the ladies of elgin however drew the line somewhere drew it at country meetings mrs farquharson went with her husband because since his state of health had handed him over to her more than ever she saw it a part of her wifely duty his retirement had been decided upon for the spring but she would be on hand to retire him at any earlier moment should the necessity arise we'll be the only female creatures there my dear she had said to dora on the way out and hesketh had praised them both for public spirit he didn't know he said how anybody would get elected in england without the ladies especially in the villages where the people were obliged to listen respectfully i wonder you can afford to throw away all the influence you get in the rural districts with soup and blankets he said but this is an extravagant country in many ways dora kept silence not being sure of the social prestige bound up with the distribution of soup and blankets but mrs farquharson set him sharply right i guess we'd rather do without our influence if it came to that she said hesketh listened with deference to her account of the rural district which had as yet produced no ladies bountiful made mental notes of several points and placed her privately as a woman of more than ordinary intelligence i have always claimed for hesketh an open mind he was filling it now to its capacity with care and satisfaction 
the schoolroom was full and waiting when they arrived jordanville had been well billed and the posters held in addition to the conspicuous names of farquharson and murchison that of mr alfred hesketh of london england there was a send-off to give to the retiring member there was a critical inspection to make of the new candidate and there was mr alfred hesketh of london england and whatever he might signify they were big quiet expectant fellows with less sophistication and polemic than their american counterparts less stolid aggressiveness than their parallels in england if they have parallels there they stood indeed for the development between the two they came of the new country but not of the new light they were democrats who had never thrown off the monarch what harm did he do there overseas they had the air of being prosperous but not prosperous enough for theories and doctrines the liberal vote of south fox had yet to be split by socialism or labor life was a decent rough business that required all their attention there was time enough for sleep but not much for speculation they sat leaning forward with their hats dropped between their knees more with the air of big schoolboys expecting an entertainment than responsible electors come together to approve their party's choice they had the uncomplaining bucolic look but they wore it with a difference the difference by this time was enough to mark them of another nation most of them had driven to the meeting it was not an adjournment from the public house nor did the air hold any hint of beer where it had an alcoholic drift the flavor was of whiskey but the stimulant of the occasion had been tea or cider and the room was full of patient good will the preliminaries were gone through with promptness the chair had supped with the speakers and mr crow had given him a friendly hint that the boys wouldn't be expecting much in the way of trimmings from him stamping and clapping from the back benches greeted mr farquharson it diminished grew more subdued as it reached the front the young fellows were mostly at the back and the power of demonstration had somehow ebbed in the old ones the retiring member addressed his constituents for half an hour he was standing before them as their representative for the last time and it was natural to look back and note the milestones behind the changes for the better with which he could fairly claim association they were matters of federal business chiefly beyond the immediate horizon of jordanville but farquharson made them a personal interest for that hour at all events and there were one or two points of educational policy which he could illustrate by their own schoolhouse he approached them as he had always done on the level of mutual friendly interest and in the hope of doing mutual friendly business you know and i know he said more than once they and he knew a number of things together he was afraid he said that if the doctors hadn't chased him out of politics he never would have gone now however that they gave him no choice he was glad to think that though times had been pretty good for the farmers of south fox all through the eleven years of his appearance in the political arena he was leaving it at a moment when they promised to be better still already he was sure they were familiar with the main heads of that attractive prospect and agreeable as the subject great as the policy was to him he would leave it to be further unfolded by the gentleman whom they all hoped to enlist in the cause as his successor for this constituency mr lorne murchison and by his friend from the old country mr alfred hesketh he farquharson would not take the words out of the mouths of these gentlemen much as he envied them the opportunity of uttering them the french academy he told them that illustrious body of literary and scientific men had a custom on the death of a member and the selection of his successor of appointing one of their number to eulogize the newcomer 
the person upon whom the task would most appropriately fall did circumstances permit would be the departing academician in this case he was happy to say circumstances did permit his political funeral was still far enough off to enable him to express his profound confidence in and his hearty admiration of the young and vigorous political heir whom the liberals of south fox had selected to stand in his shoes mr farquharson proceeded to give his grounds for this confidence and admiration reminding the jordanville electors that they had met mr murchison as a liberal standard-bearer in the last general election when he farquharson had to acknowledge very valuable services on mr murchison's part the retiring member then thanked his audience for the kind attention and support they had given him for so many years made a final cheerful joke about a pagan divinity known as anno domini and took his seat they applauded him and it was plain that they regretted him the tried friend the man there was never any doubt about whose convictions they had repeated and whose speeches in parliament they had read with a kind of proprietorship for so long the chair had to wait before introducing mr alfred hesketh until the backbenchers had got through with a double rendering of for he's a jolly good fellow which bolder spirits sent lustily forth from the ante-room where the little girls kept their hats and comforters interspersed with whoops hesketh it had been arranged should speak next and lorn last mr hesketh left his wooden chair with smiling ease the ease which is intended to level distinctions and put everybody concerned on the best of terms he said that though he was no stranger to the work of political campaigns this was the first time that he had had the privilege of addressing a colonial audience i consider said he handsomely that it is a privilege he clasped his hands behind his back and threw out his chest opinions have differed in england as to the value of the colonies and the consequence of colonials i say here with pride that i have ever been among those who insist that the value is very high and the consequence very great the fault is common to humanity but we are i fear in england too prone to be led away by appearances and to forget that under a rough unpolished exterior may beat virtues which are the brightest ornaments of civilization that in the virgin fields of the possessions which the good swords of our ancestors wrung for us from the algonquins and the and the other savages may be hidden the most glorious period of the british race mr hesketh paused and coughed his audience neglected the opportunity for applause but he had their undivided attention they were looking at him and listening to him these canadian farmers with curious interest in his attitude his appearance his inflection his whole personality as it offered itself to them it was a thing new and strange far out in the northwest where the emigrant trains had been unloading all the summer hesketh's would have been a voice from home but here in long settled ontario men had forgotten the sound of it with many other things they listened in silence weighing with folded arms appraising with chin in hand they were slow equitable men if we in england hesketh proceeded required a lesson as perhaps we did in the importance of the colonies we had it need i remind you in the course of the late protracted campaign in south africa then did the mother country indeed prove the loyalty and devotion of her colonial sons then were envious nations compelled to see the spectacle of canadians and australians rallying about the common flag eager to attest their affection for it with their life-blood and to demonstrate that they too were worthy to add deeds to british traditions and victories to the british cause 
still no mark of appreciation hesketh began to think them an unhandsome lot he stood bravely however by the note he had sounded he dilated on the pleasure and satisfaction it had been to the people of england to receive this mark of attachment from far away dominions and dependencies on the cementing of the bonds of brotherhood by the blood of the fallen on the impossibility that the mother country should ever forget such voluntary sacrifices for her sake when unexpectedly and irrelevantly from the direction of the cloak-room came the expressive comment yeah though brief nothing could have been more to the purpose and hesketh sacrificed several effective points to hurry to the quotation what should they know of england who only england know which he could not perhaps have been expected to forbear his audience however were plainly not in the vein for compliment the same voice from the ante-room inquired ironically that's so and the speaker felt advised to turn to more immediate considerations he said that he had had the great pleasure on his arrival in this country to find a political party the party in power their canadian liberal party taking initiative in a cause which he was sure they all had at heart the strengthening of the bonds between the colonies and the mother country he congratulated the liberal party warmly upon having shown themselves capable of this great function a point at which he was again interrupted and he recapitulated some of the familiar arguments about the desirability of closer union from the point of view of the army of the admiralty and from one which would come home he knew to all of them the necessity of a dependable food supply for the mother country in time of war here he quoted a noble lord he said that he believed no definite proposals had been made and he did not understand how any definite proposals could be made for his part if the new arrangement was to be in the nature of a bargain he would prefer to have nothing to do with it england he said loftily has no wish to buy the loyalty of her colonies nor i hope has any colony the desire to offer her allegiance at the price of preference in british markets even proposals for mutual commercial benefit may be underpinned i am glad to say by loftier principles than those of the market-place and the counting-house at this one of his hearers unacquainted with the higher commercial plane exclaimed how be ye goin to get em kept to then hesketh took up the question he said a friend in the audience asked how they were to ensure that such arrangements would be adhered to his answer was in the words of the duke of dartmoor by the mutual esteem the inherent integrity and the willing compromise of the british race here some one on the back benches impatient doubtless at his own incapacity to follow this high doctrine exclaimed intemperately oh shut up and the gathering remembering that this after all was not what it had come for began to hint that it had had enough in intermittent stamps and uncompromising shouts for murchison hesketh kept on his legs however a few minutes longer he had a trenchant sentence to repeat to them which he thought they would take as a direct message from the distinguished nobleman who had uttered it the marquis of aldborough was the father of the pithy thing which he had presented as it happened to hesketh himself the audience received it with respect hesketh's own respect was so marked but with misapprehension there had been too many allusions to the nobility for a community so far removed from its soothing influence had ye no friends among the commoners suddenly spoke up a dry old fellow stroking a long white beard and the roar that greeted this showed the sense of the meeting hesketh closed with assurances of the admiration and confidence he felt toward the candidate proposed to their suffrages by the liberal party 
that were quite inaudible and sought his yellow pinewood schoolroom chair with rather a forced smile it had been used once before that day to isolate conspicuous stupidity they were at bottom a good-natured and a loyal crowd and they had not after all come there to make trouble or mr alfred hesketh might have carried away a worse opinion of them as it was young murchison whose address occupied the rest of the evening succeeded in making an impression upon them distinct enough happily for his personal influence to efface that of his friend he did it by the simple expedient of talking business and as high prices for produce and low ones for agricultural implements would be more interesting there than here i will not report him he and mr farquharson waited after the meeting for a personal word with a good many of those present but it was suggested to hesketh that the ladies might be tired and that he had better get them home without unnecessary delay mrs farquharson had less comment to offer during the drive home than hesketh thought might be expected from a woman of her intelligence but miss milburn was very enthusiastic she said he had made a lovely speech and she wished her father could have heard it a personal impression during a time of political excitement travels unexpectedly far a week later mr hesketh was concernedly accosted in main street by a boy on a bicycle say mister how's the duke what duke asked hesketh puzzled oh any duke responded the boy and bicycled cheerfully away End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary christmas came and went dr drummond had long accepted the innovation of a service on christmas day as he agreed to the anthem while the collection was being taken up to flowers about the pulpit and to the habit of sitting at prayer he was a progressive by his business instinct in everything but theology where perhaps his business instinct also operated the other way in favor of the sure thing the christmas day service soon became one of those special occasions so dear to his heart which made a demand upon him out of the ordinary way he rose to these on the wing of the eagle and his congregation never lacked the lesson that could be most dramatically drawn from them his christmas day discourse gathered everything into it that could emphasize the anniversary including a vigorous attack upon the saints days and ceremonies of the church of england calculated to correct the concession of the service and pull up sharply any who thought that presbyterianism was giving way to the spurious attractions of sentimentality or ritual the special easter service with every appropriate feature of hymn and invocation was apt to be marked by an unsparing denunciation of the pageants and practices of the church of rome balance was thus preserved and principle relentlessly indicated dr drummond loved as i have said all that asked for notable comment the poet and the tragedian in him caught at the opportunity and reveled in it public events carried him far especially if they were disastrous but what he most profited by was the dealing of providence with members of his own congregation of all the occasions that inspired him the funeral sermon was his happiest opportunity nor was it in his hands by any means unstinted eulogy candid was his summing up behind the decent veil the accepted apology of death he was not afraid to refer to the follies of youth or the weaknesses of age in terms as unmistakable as they were kindly grace 
he said once of an estimable plain spinster who had passed away did more for her than ever nature had done he repeated it too she was far more indebted i say to grace than to nature and before his sharp earnestness none were seen to smile nor could you forget the note in his voice when the loss he deplored was that of a youth of virtue and promise or that of a personal friend his very text would be a blow upon the heart the eyes filled from the beginning people would often say that they were sorry for the family sitting through dr drummond's celebration of their bereavement and the sympathy was probably well founded but how fine he was when he paid the last tribute to that upright man his elder and office-bearer david davidson how his words marched sorrowing to the close much i have said of him and more than he would have had me say will it not stay with those who heard it till the very end the trenchant mournful fall of that more than he would have had me say it was a thing that hugh finlay could not abide in dr drummond as the winter passed the little doctor was hard put to it to keep his hands off the great political issue of the year bound up as it was in the tenets of his own politics which he held only less uncompromisingly than those of the shorter catechism it was unfortunately for him a gradual and peaceful progress of opinion marked by no dramatic incidents and analogy was hard to find in either testament for a change of fiscal policy based on imperial advantage dr drummond liked a pretty definite parallel he had small opinion of the practice of drawing a pint out of a thimble as he considered finlay must have done when he preached the gospel of imperialism from deuteronomy thirty fourteen but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it moreover to preach politics in knox church was a liberty in finlay the fact that finlay had been beforehand with him operated perhaps to reconcile the doctor to his difficulty and the candidature of one of his own members in what was practically the imperial interest no doubt increased his embarrassment nevertheless he would not lose sight of the matter for more than two or three weeks together many an odd blow he delivered for its furtherance by way of illustrating higher things and he kept it always so to speak in the practical politics of the long prayer it was sunday evening and abby and her husband as usual had come to tea the family was complete with the exception of lorne who had driven out to clayfield with horace williams to talk over some urgent matters with persons whom he would meet at supper at the metropole hotel at clayfield it was a thing mrs murchison thought little short of scandalous supper to talk business on the sabbath day and in a hotel a place of which the smell about the door was enough to knock you down even on a weekday mrs murchison considered and did not scruple to say so that politics should be left alone on sundays clayfield votes might be very important but there were such things as commandments she supposed it'll bring no blessing she declared severely eyeing lorne's empty place the talk about the lamplit table was nevertheless all of the election blessed or unblessed it was not in human nature that it shouldn't be as mrs murchison would have very quickly told you if you had found her inconsistent there was reason in all things as she frequently said i hear alec had told them that octavius milburn is going around bragging he's got the elgin chamber of commerce consolidated this time against us exclaimed stella and her brother said of course those milburns 
remarked mrs murchison are enough to make one's blood boil i met mrs milburn in the market yesterday she'd been pricing mrs crow's ducks and they were just five cents too dear for her and she stopped wonderful thing for her and had such an amount to say about lorne and the honour it was and the dear only knows what but her wouldn't melt in her mouth and octavius milburn doing all he knew against him the whole time that's the milburns i cut her remarkably short mrs murchison added with satisfaction and when she'd made up her mind she'd have to give that extra five cents for the ducks because there weren't any others to be had she went back and found i'd bought them well done mother said alec and oliver remarked that if those were to-day's ducks they were too good for the milburn crowd a lot i expect she wanted them too remarked stella they've got the only mr hesketh staying with them now miss filkins in a great state of excitement i guess we can spare them hesketh said john murchison he's a lobster said stella with fervour he seems to bring a frost wherever he goes continued abby's husband in politics anyhow i hear lorne wants to make a present of him to the other side for use wherever they'll let him speak longest is it true he began his speech out at jordanville gentlemen and those of you who are not gentlemen could he have meant mrs farquharson and miss milburn asked mr murchison quietly when the derision subsided and they laughed again he told me said edvina that he proposed to convert mr milburn to the imperial policy he'll have his job cut out for him said her father for my part abby told them i think the milburns are beneath contempt you don't know exactly what it is but there's something about them not that we ever come in contact with them she continued with dignity i believe they used to be patients of dr henry's till he got up in years but they don't call in harry maybe that's what there is about them said mr murchison innocently father's made up his mind announced dr harry and they waited breathless there could be only one point upon which dr henry could be dubitating at that moment he's going to vote for lorne he's a lovely old darling cried stella good for dr henry johnson i knew he would the rest were silent with independence and gratification dr henry's conservatism had been supposed to be invincible dr harry they thought a fair prey to murchison influence and he had capitulated early but he had never promised to answer for his father yes he's taken his time about it and he's consulted about all the known authorities said his son humorously went right back to the manchester school to begin with sat out on the veranda reading cobden and bright the whole summer if anybody came for advice sent him in to me i did a trade i tell you he thought they talked an awful lot of sense those fellows from the english point of view do you mean to tell me he'd say that a generation born and bred in political doctrine of that sort is going to hold on to the colonies at a sacrifice they'd rather let him go at a sacrifice well then he got to reading the other side of the question and old ormiston sent him parkin and he lent old ormiston goldwin smith and then he subscribed to the times for six months the bill must have nearly bust him and then the squire went over without waiting for him and without any assistance from the times either and finally well he says that if it's good enough business for the people of england it's good enough business for him only he keeps on worrying about the people of england and whether they'll make enough by it to keep them contented till he can't half enjoy his meals and though he's going to vote for lorne next month all right he wants it to be distinctly understood that family connection has nothing to do with it of course it hasn't edvina said but we're just as much obliged remarked stella a lot of our church people are going to stay at home election day declared abby they won't vote for lorne and they won't vote against imperialism so they'll just sulk silly i call it good enough business for us 
said Alec. Well, what I want to know is, said Mrs. Murchison, whether you are coming to the church you were born and brought up in, Abby, or not, tonight. There's the first bell. I'm not going to any church, said Abby. I went this morning. I'm going home to my baby. Your father and mother, said Mrs. Murchison, can go twice a day and be none the worse for it. By the way, father, did you know old Mrs. Parr was dead? Died this morning at four o'clock. They telephoned for Dr. Drummond, and I think they had little to do, for he had been up with her half the night already, Mrs. Forsyth told me. Did he go? asked Mr. Murchison. He did not, for the very good reason that he knew nothing about it. Mrs. Forsyth answered the telephone and told them he hadn't been two hours in his bed and she wouldn't get him out again for an unconscious deathbed and him with bronchitis on him and two sermons to preach today. Oh, weren't Mrs. Forsyth caught it in the morning, said John Murchison. That she did. The doctor was as cross as two sticks that she hadn't had him out to answer the phone i just spoke up she said and told him i didn't see how he was going to do any good to the poor soul over a telephone wire it isn't that he said but i might have put them on to peter fratch for the funeral we've never had an undertaker in the church before he said he's just come and he ought to be supported now i expect it's too late they'll have gone to liscombe he rang them up right away but they had Dr. Drummond can't stand Liscombe, said Alec, as they all laughed a little at the doctor's foible, all except Edvina, who laughed a great deal. She laughed wildly, then weakly. I wouldn't think it a pleasure to be buried by Liscombe myself, she cried hysterically, and then laughed again until the tears ran down her face, and she lay back in her chair and moaned, still laughing. Mr. and Mrs. Murchison, Alec, Stella, and Edvina made up the family party. Oliver, for reasons of his own, would attend the River Avenue Methodist Church that evening. They slipped out presently into a crisp white winter night. The snow was banked on both sides of the street. Spreading garden fir trees huddled together weighted down with it. Ragged icicles hung from the eaves or lay in long broken fingers on the trodden paths. The snow snapped and tore under their feet. There was a glorious moon that observed every tattered weed sticking up through the whiteness and etched it with its shadow. The town lay under the moon almost dramatic, almost mysterious, so withdrawn it was out of the cold, so turned in upon its own soul of the fireplace. It might have stood, in the snow and the silence, for a shell and a symbol of the humanity within, for angels or other strangers to mark with curiosity. Mr. and Mrs. Murchison were neither angels nor strangers. They looked at it, and saw that the Peterson place was still standing empty, and that old Mr. Fisher hadn't finished his new porch before zero weather came to stop him. The young people were well ahead. Mrs. Murchison, on her husband's arm, stepped along with the spring of an impetus undisclosed. "'Is it to be the doctor to-night?' asked John Murchison. He was so hoarse this morning, I wouldn't be surprised to see Finlay in the pulpit. They're getting only morning services in East Elgin just now, while they're changing the lighting arrangements. Are they indeed? Well, I hope they'll change them and be done with it, for I can't say I'm anxious for too much of their Mr. Finlay in Knox Church. Oh, you like the man well enough for a change, mother, John assured her. I've nothing to say against his preaching. It's the fellow himself, and I hope we won't get him to-night, for the way I feel now, if I see him gawking up the pulpit steps, it'll be as much as I can do to keep in my seat, and so I just tell you, John. You're a little out of patience with him, I see, said Mr. Murchison. And it would be a good thing if more than me were out of patience with him. There's such a thing as too much patience, I've noticed. I dare say replied her husband cheerfully. If Advina were any daughter of mine, she'd have less patience with him. She's not much like you, 
assented the father i must say i like a girl to have a little spirit if a man has none and before i'd have him coming to the house week after week the way he has i'd see him far enough he might as well come there as anywhere mr murchison replied ambiguously i suppose he has now and then time on his hands well he won't have it on his hands much longer he won't eh no he won't mrs murchison almost shook the arm she was attached to john i think you might show a little interest the man's going to be married you don't say that john murchison's tone expressed not only astonishment but concern mrs murchison was almost mollified but i do say it his future wife is coming here to elgin next month she and her aunt or her grandmother or somebody and they're to stay at dr drummond's and be married as soon as possible nonsense said mr murchison which was his way of expressing simple astonishment there's no nonsense about it edvina told me herself this afternoon did she seem put out about it she's not a girl to show it mrs murchison hedged if she was i just looked at her well i said that's a piece of news when did you hear it i said oh i've known it all the winter says my lady what i wanted to say was that for an engaged man he had been pretty liberal with his visits but she had such a queer look in her eyes i couldn't express myself somehow it was just as well left unsaid her husband told her thoughtfully i'm not so sure mrs murchison retorted you're a great man john for letting everything alone when he's been coming here regularly for more than a year putting ideas into the girl's head he seems to have told her how things were that's all very well if he had kept himself to himself at the same time well mother you know you never thought much of the prospect no i didn't mrs murchison said it wouldn't be me that would be married to him and i've always said so but i'd got more or less used to it she confessed the man's well enough in some ways dear knows there would be a pair of them one's as much of a muddler as the other and anybody can see with half an eye that edvina likes him it hasn't turned out as i expected that's a fact john and i'm just very much annoyed i'm not best pleased about it myself said john murchison expressing as usual a very small proportion of the regret that he felt but i suppose they know their own business thus in their different ways did these elder ones also acknowledge their helplessness before the advancing event they could talk of it in private and express their dissatisfaction with it and that was all they could do it would not be a matter much further turned over between them at best they would be shy of any affair of sentiment in terms of speech and from one that affected a member of the family self-respect would help to pull them the other way mrs murchison might remember it in the list of things which roused her vain indignation john murchison would put it away in the limbo of irremediables that were better forgotten for the present they had reached the church door mrs murchison saw with relief that dr drummond occupied his own pulpit but if her glance had gone the length of three pews behind her she would have discovered that hugh finlay made one of the congregation fortunately perhaps for her enjoyment of the service she did not look round dr drummond was more observing but his was a position of advantage in the accustomed sea of faces two heavy shadowed and obstinately facing fate swam together before dr drummond and after he had lifted his hands and closed his eyes for the long prayer he saw them still so that these words occurred near the end in the long prayer o thou searcher of hearts who hast known man from the beginning to whom his highest desires and his loftiest intentions are but as the desires and intentions of a little child 
look with thine own compassion we beseech thee upon souls before thee in any peculiar difficulty our mortal life is full of sin it is also full of the misconception of virtue do thou clear the understanding o lord of such as would interpret thy will to their own undoing do thou teach them that as happiness may reside in chastening so chastening may reside in happiness and though such stand fast to their hurt do thou grant to them in thine own way which may not be our way a safe issue out of the dangers that beset them dr drummond had his own method of reconciling foreordination and free will to advina his supplication came with that mysterious double emphasis of chance words that fit her thought played upon them all through the sermon rejecting and rejecting again their application and their argument and the spring of hope in them she too knew that finley was in church and half timidly she looked back for him as the congregation filed out again into the winter streets but he furious and more resolved than ever had gone home by another way End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary octavius milburn was not far beyond the facts when he said that the elgin chamber of commerce was practically solid this time against the liberal platform though to what extent this state of things was due to his personal influence might be a matter of opinion mr milburn was president of the chamber of commerce and his name stood for one of the most thriving of elgin's industries but he was not a person of influence except as it might be represented in a draft on the bank of british north america he had never converted anybody to anything and never would possibly because the governing principle of his life was the terror of being converted to anything himself if an important non-entity is an imaginable thing perhaps it would stand for mr milburn and he found it a more valuable combination than it may appear since his importance gave him position and opportunity and his non-entity saved him from their risks certainly he had not imposed his view upon his fellow members they would have blown it off like a feather yet they found themselves much of his mind most of them were manufacturing men of the conservative party whose factories had been nursed by high duties upon the goods of outsiders and few even of the liberals among them felt inclined to abandon this immediate safeguard for a benefit more or less remote and more or less disputable john murchison thought otherwise and put it in few words as usual he said he was more concerned to see big prices in british markets for canadian crops than he was to put big prices on ironware he couldn't sell he was more afraid of hard times among the farmers of canada than he was of competition by the manufacturers of england that is what he said when he was asked if it didn't go against the grain a little to have to support a son who advocated low duties on british ranges and when he was not asked he said nothing disliking the discount that was naturally put upon his opinion parsons of the blanket mills bolted at the first hint of the new policy and justified it by reminding people that he always said he would if it ever looked like business we give their woolen goods a pull of a third as it is he said which is just a third more than i approve of i don't propose to vote to make it any bigger can't afford it he had some followers but there were also some like young of the plough works and windle who made bicycles who announced that there was no need to change their politics to defeat a measure that had no existence 
and never would have what sickened them they declared was to see young murchison allowed to give it so much prominence as liberal doctrine the party had been strong enough to hold south fox for the best part of the last twenty years on the old principles and this british bootlicking feature wasn't going to do it any good it was fool politics in the opinion of mr young and mr windle then remained the retail trades the professions and the farmers both sides could leave out of their councils the interests of the leisured class since the leisured class in elgin consisted almost entirely of persons who were too old to work and therefore not influential the landed proprietors were the farmers when they weren't alas the banks as to the retail men the prosperity of the stores of main street and market street was bound up about equally with that of fox county and the elgin factories the lawyers and doctors the odd surveyors and engineers were inclined by their greater detachment to theories and prejudices delightful luxuries where a certain rigidity of opinion is dictated by considerations of bread and butter they made a factor debatable but small the farmers had everything to win nothing to lose the prospect offered them more for what they had to sell and less for what they had to buy and most of them were liberals already but the rest had to be convinced and a political change of heart in a bosom of south fox was as difficult as any other industrial commercial professional agricultural lorne murchison scanned them all hopefully but walter winter felt them his garnered sheaves it will be imagined how mr winter as a practical politician rejoiced in the aspect of things the fundamental change with its incalculable chances to play upon the opening of the gate to admit plain detriment in the first instance for the sake of benefit easily be clouded in the second the effective arm in the hands of a satirist of sentiment in politics and if there was a weapon mr winter owned a weakness for it was satire the whole situation as he often confessed suited him down to the ground he professed himself though no optimist under any circumstances very well pleased only in one other place he declared would he have preferred to conduct a campaign at the present moment on the issue involved though he would have to change his politics to do it there and that place was england he cast an envious eye across the ocean at the trenchant argument of the dear loaf he had no such straight road to the public stomach and grand arbitrator of the fate of empires if the liberals in england failed to turn out the government over this business they would lose in his eyes all the respect he ever had for them which wasn't much he acknowledged when his opponents twitted him with discrepancy here since a bargain so bad for one side could hardly fail to favor the other he poured all his contempt on the scheme as concocted by damned enthusiasts for the ruin of business men of both countries such persons mr winter said if they could have their way would be happy and satisfied but in his opinion neither england nor the colonies could afford to please them as much as that he professed loud contempt for the opinions of the conservative party organs at toronto and stood boldly for his own views that was what would happen he declared in every manufacturing division in the country if the issue came to be fought in a general election he was against the scheme root and branch mr winter was skilled practised and indefatigable we need not follow him in all his ways and works a good many of his arguments i fear must also escape us the elgin mercury if consulted would produce them in daily disclosure so would the clayfield standard 
one of these offered a good deal of sympathy to mayor winter the veteran of so many good fights in being asked to contest south fox with an opponent who had not so much as a village reeve ship to his public credit if the conservative candidate felt the damage to his dignity however he concealed it in elgin and clayfield where factory chimneys had also begun to point the way to enterprise winter had a clear field official reports gave him figures to prove the great and increasing prosperity of the country astonishing figures of capital coming in of emigrants landing of new lands broken new mineral regions exploited new railways projected of stocks and shares normal safe assured he could ask the manufacturers of elgin to look no further than themselves which they were quite willing to do for illustration of the plenty and the promise which reigned in the land from one end to the other he could tell them that in their own province more than one hundred new industries had been established in the last year he could ask them and he did ask them whether this was a state of things to disturb with an inrush from british looms and rolling mills and they told him with applause that it was not country audiences were not open to arguments like these they were slow in the country as the mercury complained to understand that agricultural prospects were bound up with the prosperity of the towns and cities they had been especially slow in the country in england as the express ironically pointed out to understand it so winter and his supporters asked the farmers of south fox if they were prepared to believe all they heard of the good will of england to the colonies with the flattering assumption that they were by no means prepared to believe it was it a likely thing mr winter inquired that the people of great britain were going to pay more for their flour and their bacon their butter and their cheese than they had any need to do simply out of a desire to benefit countries which most of them had never seen and never would see no said mr winter they might take it from him that was not the idea but mr winter thought there was an idea and that they and he together would not have much trouble in deciphering it he did not claim to be longer sighted in politics than any other man but he thought the present british idea was pretty plain it was in two words to secure the canadian market for british goods and a handsome contribution from the canadian taxpayer toward the expense of the british army and navy in return for the offer of favors to food supplies from canada but this as they all knew was not the first time favors had been offered by the british government to food supplies from canada just sixty years ago the british government had felt one of these spasms of benevolence to canada and there were men sitting before him who could remember the good will and the gratitude the hope and the confidence that greeted stanley's bill of that year which admitted canadian wheat and flour at a nominal duty some could remember and those who could not remember could read how the farmers and the millers of ontario took heart and laid out capital and how money was easy and enterprise was everywhere and how agricultural towns such as elgin was at that time set up streets of shops to accommodate the trade that was to pour in under the new and generous preference granted to the dominion by the mother country and how long mr winter demanded swinging round in that pivotal manner which seems assisted by thumbs in the armholes of the waistcoat how long did the golden illusion last precisely three years in precisely three years the british nation compelled the british government to adopt the free trade act of forty six the wheat of the world flowed into every port in england and the hopes of canada especially the hopes of ontario based then as now on preferential treatment were blasted to the root 
enterprise was laid flat mortgages were foreclosed shops were left empty the milling and forwarding interests were temporarily ruined and the governor-general actually wrote to the secretary of state in england that things were so bad that not a shilling could be raised on the credit of the province now mr winter did not blame the people of england for insisting on free food it was the policy that suited their interests and they had just as good a right to look after their interests he conceded handsomely as anybody else but he did blame the british government for holding out hopes for making definite pledges to a young and struggling nation which they must have known they would not be able to redeem he blamed their action then and he would blame it now if the opportunity were given to them to repeat it for the opportunity would pass and the pledge would pass into the happy hunting ground of unrealizable politics but not and mr winter asked his listeners to mark this very carefully not until canada was committed to such relations of trade and taxes with the imperial government as would require the most heroic efforts it might run to a war to extricate herself from in plain words mr winter assured his country audiences great britain had sold them before and she would sell them again he stood there before them as loyal to british connection as any man he addressed a public as loyal to british connection as any public but once bitten twice shy horace williams might riddle such arguments from end to end in the next day's express but if there is a thing that we enjoy in the country it is having the dodges of government shown up with ignominy and mr winter found his account in this historic parallel nothing could have been more serious in public than his line of defence against the danger that menaced but in friendly ears mr winter derided it as a practical possibility like the liberals young and windle it seems to me he said talking to octavius milburn that the important thing at present is the party attitude to the disposition of crown lands and to government-made railways as for this racket of wallingham's it has about as much in it as an empty bun-bag he's running round taking a lot of satisfaction blowing it out just now and the swells over there are clapping like anything but the first knock will show that it's just a bun-bag with a hole in it folks in the old country are solid on the buns though said milburn as they parted and alfred hesketh who was walking with his host said it's bound in the end to get down to that isn't it presently hesketh came back to it quaint idea that describing wallingham's policy as a bun bag he said and laughed winter is an amusing fellow wallingham's policy won't even be a bun-bag much longer said milburn it won't be anything at all imperial union is very nice to talk about but when you come down to hard fact it's australia for the australians canada for the canadians africa for the africans every time each for himself and devil take the hindmost said hesketh and when the hindmost is england as our friend murchison declares it will be so much the worse for england said milburn amiably but we should all be sorry to see it and for my part i don't believe such a thing is at all likely and you may be certain of one thing he continued impressively no flag but the union jack will ever wave over canada oh i'm sure of that hesketh responded since i have heard more of your side of the question i am quite convinced that loyalty to england and complete commercial independence i might say even commercial antagonism may exist together in the colonies it seems paradoxical but it is true mr hesketh had naturally been hearing a good deal more of mr milburn's side of the question staying as he was under mr milburn's hospitable roof it had taken the least persuasion in the world to induce him to make the milburns a visit 
he found them delightful people he described them in his letters home as the most typically canadian family he had met quite simple and unconventional but thoroughly warm-hearted and touchingly devoted to far-away england politically he could not see eye to eye with mr milburn but he could quite perceive mr milburn's grounds for the view he held one thing he explained to his correspondence you learned at once by visiting the colonies and that was to make allowance for local conditions both social and economic he and mr milburn had long serious discussions staying behind in the dining-room to have them after tea when the ladies took their fancy-work into the drawing-room and dora's light touch was heard upon the piano it may be supposed that hesketh brought every argument forward in favour of the great departure that had been conceived in england he certainly succeeded in interesting his host very deeply in the english point of view he had however to encounter one that was made in canada it resided in mr milburn as a stone might reside in a bag of wool mr milburn wouldn't say that this preference trade idea if practicable might not work out for the benefit of the empire as a whole that was a thing he didn't pretend to know but it wouldn't work out for his benefit that was a thing he did know when a man was confronted with a big political change the question he naturally asked himself was is it going to be worth my while and he acted on the answer to that question he was able to explain to hesketh by a variety of facts and figures of fascinating interest to the inquiring mind just how and where such a concern as the milburn boiler company would be hit by the new policy after which he asked his guest fairly now if you were in my shoes would you see your way to voting for any such thing if i were in your shoes said hesketh thoughtfully i can't say i would on grounds of sentiment octavius assured him they were absolutely at one but in practical matters a man had to proceed on business principles he went about at this time expressing great esteem for hesketh's capacity to assimilate facts his opportunity to assimilate them was not curtailed by any further demand for his services in the south fox campaign he was as willing as ever he told lorne murchison to enlist under the flag and not for the first time but murchison and farquharson and that lot while grateful for the offer seemed never quite able to avail themselves of it the fact was all the dates were pretty well taken up no doubt hesketh acknowledged the work could be done best by men familiar with the local conditions but he could not avoid the conviction that this attitude toward proffered help was very like dangerous trifling possibly these circumstances gave him an added impartiality for mr milburn's facts as the winter advanced his enthusiasm for the country increased with his intelligent appreciation of the possibilities of the elgin boiler the elgin boiler was his object lesson in the development of the colonies he paid several visits to the works to study it and several times he thanked mr milburn for the opportunity of familiarizing himself with such an important and promising branch of canadian industry it looks said octavius one evening in early february as if the grits were getting a little anxious about south fox high time too i see crookshank is down to speak at clayfield on the seventh and tellier is to be here for the big meeting at the opera house on the eleventh tellier is minister of public works isn't he asked hesketh yes and crookshank is an ex-minister replied mr milburn looks pretty shaky when they've got to take men like that away from their work in the middle of the session i shall be glad remarked his daughter dora when this horrid election is over it spoils everything she spoke a little fretfully the election and the matters it involved did interfere a good deal with her interest in life 
as an occupation it absorbed lorne murchison even more completely than she occasionally desired and as a topic it took up a larger share of the attention of mr alfred hesketh than she thought either reasonable or pleasing between politics and boilers miss milburn almost felt at times that the world held a second place for her End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the progress of mrs kilbannon and miss christy cameron up the river to montreal and so west to elgin was one series of surprises most of them pleasant and instructive to such a pair of intelligent scotch women if we leave out the number of roman catholic churches that lift their special symbol along the banks of the st lawrence and the fact that hugh finlay was not in elgin to meet them upon their arrival dr drummond of course was there at the station to explain finlay had been obliged to leave for winnipeg only the day before to attend a mission conference in place of a delegate who had been suddenly laid aside by serious illness finlay he said had been very loath to go but there were many reasons why it was imperative that he should dr drummond explained them all i insisted on it he assured them frankly i told him i would take the responsibility he seemed very capable of taking it both the ladies must have thought with his quick orders about the luggage and his waiting cab mrs kilbannon said so i'm sure she told him we are better off with you than with hugh he was always a daft dependence at a railway station they both mrs kilbannon and dr drummond looked out of the corners of their eyes so to speak at christie the only one who might be expected to show any sensitiveness but miss cameron accepted the explanation with readiness indeed she said she would have been real vexed if mr finlay had stayed behind on her account she showed herself well aware of the importance of a nomination and the desirability of responding to it it will just give me an opportunity of seeing the town she said looking at it through the cab windows as they drove and dr drummond had to admit that she seemed a sensible creature other things being equal finlay might be doing very well for himself as they talked of scotland it transpired that dr drummond knew all the braes about bross as a boy he found himself more than ever annoyed with finlay about the inequality of other things and when they passed knox church and miss cameron told him she hadn't realized it was so imposing an edifice he felt downright sorry for the woman dr drummond had persuaded finlay to go to winnipeg with a vague hope that something in the fortnight's grace thus provided might be induced to happen the form it oftenest took to his imagination was miss christie's announcement when she set foot upon the station platform that she had become engaged on the way over to somebody else some fellow-traveller such things dr drummond knew did come about usually bringing distress and discomfiture in their train why then should they not happen when all the consequences would be rejoiceful it was plain enough however that nothing of the kind had come to pass miss christie had arrived in elgin bringing her affections intact they might have been in any one of her portmanteaux she had come with definite calm intention precisely in the guise in which she should have been expected at the very hour in the very clothes she was there robust and pleasant with a practical eye on her promising future she had arrived the fulfilment of despair dr drummond looked at her with acquiescence half cowed half comic wondering at his own folly in dreaming of anything else miss cameron brought the situation as it were with her it had to be faced and dr drummond faced it like a philosopher she was the material necessity the fact in the case the substantiation of her own legend 
and dr drummond promptly gave her all the consideration she demanded in this aspect already he heard himself pronouncing a blessing over the pair and they would make the best of it with characteristic dispatch he decided that the marriage should take place the first monday after finley's return that would give them time to take a day or two in toronto perhaps and get back for finley's wednesday prayer meeting or i could take it off his hands said dr drummond to himself that would free them till the end of the week solicitude increased in him that the best should be made of it after all for a long time they had been making the worst mrs forsyth whom it had been necessary to inform when mrs kilbannon and miss cameron became actually imminent saw plainly that the future mrs finlay had made a very good impression on the doctor and as nature in mrs forsyth's case was more powerful than grace she became critical accordingly still she was an honest soul she found more fault with what she called miss cameron's shirt-waists than with miss cameron herself whom she didn't doubt to be a good woman though she would never see thirty-five again time and observation would no doubt mend or remodel the shirt-waists and meanwhile both they and miss cameron would do very well for east elgin mrs forsyth avowed mrs kilbannon definitely given over to caps and curls as they still wear them in brass mrs forsyth at once formed a great opinion of she might be something mrs forsyth thought out of a novel by mr crockett and made you long to go to scotland where presumably every one was like her on the whole the ladies from brass profited rather than lost by the new frame they stepped into in the house of dr drummond of elgin ontario their special virtues of dignity and solidity and frugality stood out saliently against the ease and unconstraint about them in the profusion of the table it was little less than edifying to hear mrs kilbannon invited to preserves say thank you i have butter it was the pleasantest spectacle happily common enough of the world's greatest inheritance we see it in immigrants of all degrees and we may perceive it in miss cameron and mrs kilbannon they come in couples and in companies from those little imperial islands bringing the crusted qualities of the old blood bottled there so long and sink with grateful absorption into the wide bountiful stretches of the further countries they have much to take but they give themselves and so it comes about that the empire is summed up in the race and the flag flies for its ideals mrs forsyth had been told of the approaching event but neither dr drummond who was not fond of making communications he did not approve of nor the murchisons who were shy of the matter as a queer business which edwina seemed too much mixed up with had mentioned it to any one else finlay himself had no intimates and moved into his new house in river street under little comment his doings excited small surprise because the town knew too little about him to expect him to do one thing more than another he was very significant among his people very important in their lives but not somehow at any expense to his private self he knew them but they did not know him and it is high praise of him that this was no grievance among them they would tell you without resentment that the minister was a very reserved man there might be even a touch of proper pride in it the worshippers of knox church mission were rather a reserved lot themselves it was different with the methodists plenty of expansion there elgin therefore knew nothing beyond the fact that dr drummond had two ladies from the old country staying with him about whom particular curiosity would hardly be expected outside of knox church in view of finley's absence dr drummond consulting with mrs kilbannon decided that for the present elgin need not be further informed there was no need they agreed to give people occasion to talk 
and it would just be a nuisance to have to make so many explanations both mrs kilbannon and her niece belonged to the race that takes great satisfaction in keeping its own counsel their situation gained for them the further interest that nothing need be said about it and the added importance of caution was plainly to be discerned in their bearing even toward one another it was a portentous business this of marrying a minister under the most ordinary circumstances not to be lightly dealt with and even more of an undertaking in a far new country where the very wind blew differently and the extraordinary freedom of conversation made it more than ever necessary to take heed to what you were saying so far as miss cameron and mrs kilbannon were aware the matter had not been spoken of elsewhere at all dr drummond remembering at vena murchison's acquaintance with it had felt the weight of a complication and had discreetly held his tongue mrs kilbannon approved her nephew in this connection hugh she said was never one to let on more than necessary it was a fine secret between hugh in winnipeg whence he had written all that was lawful or desirable and themselves at dr drummond's miss cameron said it would give her more freedom to look about her in the midst of all this security and on the very first day after their arrival it was disconcerting to be told that a lady whose name they had never heard before had called to see miss cameron and mrs kilbannon they had not even appeared at church as they told one another with dubious glances they had no reason whatever to expect visitors dr drummond was in the cemetery burying a member mrs forsyth was also abroad now who in the world asked mrs kilbannon of miss cameron is miss murchison they come to our church said sarah in the door they've got the foundry it's the oldest one she teaches sarah in the door was even more disconcerting than an unexpected visitor sarah invariably took them off their guard in the door or anywhere she freely invited their criticism but they would not have known how to mend her they looked at her now helplessly and mrs kilbannon said very well we will be down directly it may be just some friendly body she said as they descended the stairs together or it may be common curiosity in that case we'll disappoint it whatever they expected therefore it was not edvina it was not a tall young woman with expressive eyes a manner which was at once abrupt and easy and rather a lounging way of occupying the corner of a sofa when she sat down as mrs kilbannon said afterward she seemed to untie and fling herself as you might a parcel neither mrs kilbannon nor christy cameron could possibly be untied or flung so perhaps they gave this capacity in advina more importance than it had but it was only a part of what was to them a new human demonstration something to inspect very carefully and accept very cautiously the product like themselves yet so suspiciously different of these free airs and these astonishingly large ideas in some ways as she sat there in her graceful dress and careless attitude asking them direct smiling questions about their voyage she imposed herself as the class whom both these ladies of brass would acknowledge unquestioningly to be above them in others she seemed to be of no class at all so far she came short of small standards of speech and behavior the ladies from brass more and more confused grew more and more reticent when suddenly out of a simple remark of miss cameron's about missing in the train the hot water cans they gave you to your feet in scotland reticence descended upon miss murchison also she sat in an odd silence looking at miss cameron absorbed apparently in the need of looking at her finding nothing to say 
her flow of pleasant inquiry dried up and all her soul at work instead to perceive the woman mrs kilbannon was beginning to think better of her it was so much more natural to be a little backward with strangers when the moment passed their visitor drew herself out of it with almost a perceptible effort and seemed to glance consideringly at them in their aloofness their incommunicativeness their plain odds with her i don't know what she expected but we may assume that she was there simply to offer herself up and the impulse of sacrifice seldom considers whether or not it may be understood it was to her a normal natural thing that a friend of hugh finley's should bring an early welcome to his bride and to do the normal natural thing at keen personal cost was to sound that depth or rise to that height of the spirit where pain sustains we know of edvina that she was prone to this form of exaltation those who feel themselves capable may pronounce whether she would have been better at home crying in her bedroom she decided badly how could she decide well on what she would say to explain herself i am so sorry she told them that mr finley is obliged to be away it was quite wrong it assumed too much her knowledge and their confidence and the propriety of discussing mr finley's absence there was even an unconscious hint of another kind of assumption in it a suggestion of apology for mr finley advina was aware of it even as it left her lips and the perception covered her with a damning blush she had a sudden terrified misgiving that her role was too high for her that she had already cracked her mask but she looked quietly at miss cameron and smiled across the tide that surged in her as she added he was very distressed at having to go they looked at her in an instant's blank astonishment miss cameron opened her lips and closed them again glancing at mrs kilbannon they fell back together but not in disorder this was something much more formidable than common curiosity just what it was they would consider later meanwhile mrs kilbannon responded with what she would have called cool civility perhaps you have heard that mr finley is my nephew she said indeed i have mr finley has told me a great deal about you mrs kilbannon and about his life at bross edvina replied and he has told me about you too she went on turning to christy cameron indeed said she oh a long time ago he has been looking forward to your arrival for some months hasn't he we took our passages in december said miss cameron and you are to be married almost immediately are you not miss murchison continued pleasantly mrs kilbannon had an inspiration could he by any means have had the bands cried she demanded of christy who looked piercingly at their visitor for the answer oh no edvina laughed softly presbyterians haven't that custom over here does it still exist anywhere mr finley told me himself has he informed all his acquaintances asked mrs kilbannon we thought maybe his elders would be expecting to hear or his board of management or he might have just dropped a word to his sessions clerk but edvina shook her head i think it unlikely she said then why would he be telling you inquired the elder lady bluntly he told me i suppose because i have the honor to be a friend of his edvina said smiling but he is not a man is he who makes many friends it is possible i dare say that he has mentioned it to no one else poor edvina she had indeed uttered her ideal to unsympathetic ears brought her pig as her father would have said to the wrong market she sat before the ladies from bross hugh finley's only confidant 
she sat handsome and upheld and not altogether penetrable a kind of gypsy to their understanding though indeed the romany strain in her was beyond any divining of theirs they on their part reposed in their clothes with all their bristles out what else could have been expected of them convinced in their own minds that they had come not only to a growing but to a forward country mrs kilbannon was perhaps a little severe i wonder that we have not heard of you miss murchison said she but we are happy to make the acquaintance of any of my nephew's friends you will have heard him preach perhaps often said edvina rising we have no one here who can compare with him in preaching there was very little reason why you should have heard of me i am of no importance she hesitated and fought for an instant with a trembling of the lip but now that you have been persuaded to be a part of our life here she said to christy i thought i would like to come and offer you my friendship because it is his already i hope so much that you will be happy here it is a nice little place and i want you to let me help you about your house and in every way that is possible i am sure i can be of use she paused and looked at their still half hostile faces i hope she faltered you don't mind my having come not at all said christie and mrs kilbannon added i'm sure you mean it very kindly a flash of the comedy of it shot up in edvina's eyes yes she said i do good-bye if they had followed her departure they would have been further confounded to see her walk not quite steadily away shaken with fantastic laughter they looked instead at one another as if to find the solution of the mystery where indeed it lay in themselves she doesn't even belong to his congregation said christy just a friend she said i expect the friendships mostly upon her side remarked mrs kilbannon she seemed frank enough about it but i would see no necessity for encouraging her friendship on my own account if i were in your place christy i think i'll manage without it said christy End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the south fox fight was almost over three days only remained before the polling booths would be open and the voters of the towns of elgin and clayfield and the surrounding townships would once again be invited to make their choice between a liberal and a conservative representative of the district in the dominion house of commons the ground had never been more completely covered every inch of advantage more stubbornly held by either side in the political history of the riding there was no doubt of the hope that sat behind the deprecation in walter winter's eye nor of the anxiety that showed through the confidence freely expressed by the liberal leaders the issue would be no foregone conclusion as it had been practically any time within the last eleven years and as horace williams remarked to the select lot that met pretty frequently at the express office for consultation and rally they had no use for any sort of carelessness it was undeniably felt that the new idea the great idea whose putative fatherhood in canada certainly lay at the door of the liberal party had drawn in fewer supporters than might have been expected in england wallingham wearing it like a medal seemed to be courting political excommunication with it except that wallingham was so hard to effectively curse the ex-minister deserved clearly any ban that could be put upon him no sort of remonstrance could hold him from going about openly and persistently exhorting people to think imperially a liberty which as is well known the holy cobdenite church supreme in those islands expressly forbids 
wallingham appeared to think that by teaching and explaining he could help his fellow islanders to see further than the length of their fists and exorcise from them the spirit only a century and a quarter older and a trifle more sophisticated that lost them the american colonies but so far little had transpired to show that wallingham was stronger than nature and destiny there had been wallingham meetings of remarkable enthusiasm his supporters called them epoch making as if epochs were made of shears but the working man of great britain was declaring stolidly in the by-elections against any favor to colonial produce at his expense thereby showing himself one of those humble instruments that providence uses for the downfall of arrogant empires it will be thus no doubt that the working man will explain in the future his eminent usefulness to the government of his country and it will be in these terms that the cost of educating him by means of the ballot will be demonstrated meanwhile we may look on and cultivate philosophy or we may make war upon the gods with mr wallingham which is perhaps the better part that to turn from recrimination was what they saw in canada looking across the queerest thing of all was the recalcitrance of the farm laborer they could only stare at that and it may be that the spectacle was depressing to hopeful initiative at all events it was plain that the new policy was suffering from a certain flatness on the further side as a ballon d'essai it lacked buoyancy and no doubt mr farquharson was right in declaring that above all things it lacked actuality business the proposition in good set terms for men to turn over to accept or reject nothing could be done with it mr farquharson averred as a mere prospect it was useful only to its enemies we of the young countries must be invited to deeds not theories of which we have a restless impatience and this particular theory though of golden promise was beginning to recoil to some extent upon the cause which had been confident enough to adopt it before it could be translated into action and its hard equivalent the elgin mercury probably overstated the matter when it said that the grits were dead sick of the preference they would never get but horace williams was quite within the mark when he advised lorne to stick to old reform principles clean administration generous railway policy sympathetic labor legislation and freeze himself a little on imperial love and attachment they're not so sweet on it in ottawa as they were by a long shot he said look at the premier's speech to the chambers of commerce in montreal pretty plain statement that of a few things the british government needn't expect oh i don't know said lorne he was talking to manufacturers you know a pretty skittish lot anywhere it sounded independent but if you look into it you won't find it gave the cause away any the old man's got to think of quebec where his fat little majority lives remarked bingham chairman of the most difficult subdivision in the town the premier of this country drives a team you know yes said lorne but he drives it tandem and johnny francois is the second horse maybe so returned mr williams but the organ's singing pretty small too look at this he picked up the dominion from the office table and read aloud if great britain wishes to do a deal with the colonies she will find them willing to meet her in a spirit of fairness and enthusiasm but it is for her to decide and canada would be the last to force her bread down the throat of the british laborer at a higher price than he can afford to pay for it what's that my boy is it high-mindedness no sir it's lukewarmness the dominion makes me sick said young murchison it's so scared of the tory source of the scheme in england that it's handing the whole boom of the biggest chance this country ever had over to the tories here if anything will help us to lose it that will no conservative government in canada can put through a cent of preference on english goods when it comes to the touch and they know it they are full of loyalty just now baying the moon 
but if anybody opens a window they'll turn tail fast enough i guess the dominion knows it too said mr williams when great britain is quite sure she's ready to do business on preference lines it's the liberal party on this side she'll have to talk to no use showing ourselves too anxious you know besides it might do harm over there we're all right we're on record wallingham knows as well as we do the lines we're open on he's heard them from canadian liberals more than once when they get good and ready they can let us know jolly them up with it at your meetings by all means advised bingham but use it as a kind of superfluous taffy don't make it your main layout the reform association of south fox had no more energetic officer than bingham though as he sat on the edge of the editorial table chewing portions of the margin of that afternoon's express and drawling out maxims to the liberal candidate you might not have thought so he was explaining that he had been in this business for years and had never had a job that gave him so much trouble we'll win out he said but the canvas isn't any christmas joy not this time there's jim whalen he told them we all know what jim is a tory from way back where they make em so they last and a soaker from way back too one day on his job and two days sleepin off his whiskey now we don't need jim whalen's vote never did need it but the boys have generally been able to see that one of those two days was election day there's no necessity for jim's putting in his paper a character like that no necessity at all he'd much better be comfortable in bed this time i'm darned if the old boozer hasn't sworn off tells the boys he's on to their game and there's no liquor in this town that's good enough to get him to lose his vote wouldn't get drunk on champagne he's held out for ten days already and it looks like winter'd take his cross all right on thursday i guess i'd let him have it bingham said lord murchison with a kind of tolerant deprecation void of offence the only manner in which he knew how to convey disapproval to the older man the boys in your division are a pretty tough lot anyhow we don't want the other side getting hold of any monkey tricks it's necessary to win this election young man said bingham lawfully you won't have any trouble with my bunch it was not as will be imagined the first discussion so late in the day of the value of the preference trade argument to the liberal campaign they had all realized after the first few weeks that their young candidate was a trifle overbitten with it though remonstrance had been a good deal curbed by murchison's treatment of it when he had brought it forward at the late fall fairs and in the lonely country schoolhouses his talk had been so trenchant so vivid and pictorial that the gathered farmers listened with open mouths like children pathetically used with life to a grown-up fairy tale as horace williams said if a dead horse could be made to go this one would have brought murchison romping in and lorne had taken heed to the counsel of his party leaders at joint meetings which offered the enemy his best opportunity for travesty and derision he had left it in the background of debate devoting himself to arguments of more immediate utility in the literature of the campaign it glowed with prospective benefit but vaguely like a halo of liberal conception and possible achievement waiting for the word from overseas the express still approved it but not in headlines and wished the fact to be widely understood that while the imperial idea was a very big idea the liberals of south fox were going to win this election without any assistance from it lorne submitted after all victory was the thing there could be no conquest for the idea without the party triumph first he submitted but his heart rebelled 
he looked over the subdivisional reports with williams and farquharson and gave ear to their warning interpretations but his heart was an optimist and turned always to the splendid projection upon the future that was so incomparably the title to success of those who would unite to further it his mind accepted the old working formulas for dealing with an average electorate but to his eager apprehending heart it seemed unbelievable that the great imperial possibility the dramatic chance for the race that hung even now in the history of the world between the rising and the setting of the sun should fail to be perceived and acknowledged as the paramount issue the contingency which made the by-election of south fox an extraordinary and momentous affair he believed in the idea he saw it with wallingham not only a glorious prospect but an educative force and never had he a moment of such despondency that it confounded him upon his horizon in the faded colours of some old elizabethan mirage the opera house the night of mr murchison's final address to the electors of south fox was packed from floor to ceiling and a large and patient overflow made the best of the hearing accommodation of the corridors and the foyer a minister was to speak sir matthew tellier who held the portfolio of public works and for drawing a crowd in elgin there was nothing to compare with a member of the government he was the sum of all ambition and the centre of all importance he was held to have achieved in the loftiest sense and probably because he deserved to a kind of afflatus sat upon him they paid him real deference and they flocked to hear him cruikshank was a second attraction and lorne himself even at this stage of the proceedings drew without abatement they knew young murchison well enough he had gone in and out among them all his life yet since he had come before them in this new capacity a curious interest had gathered about him people looked at him as if he had developed something they did not understand and perhaps he had he was in touch with the idea they listened with an intense personal interest in him which no doubt went to obscure what he said perhaps a less absorbing personality would have carried the idea further however they did look and listen that was the main point and on their last opportunity they were in the opera house in great numbers lorne faced them with an enviable security the friendliness of the meeting was in the air the gathering was almost entirely of one political complexion the conservatives of the town would have been glad enough to turn out to hear minister tellier but the liberals were of no mind to gratify them at the cost of having to stand themselves and were on hand early to assert a prior moral claim to chairs in the seated throng lorne could pick out the fine head of his father and his mother's face bright with anticipation beside Advina was there too and stella and the boys would have a perch not too conspicuous somewhere in the gallery dr drummond was in the second row and a couple of strange ladies with him he was chuckling with uncommon humour at some remark of the younger one when lorne noted him old sandy mcquat was in a good place had been since six o'clock and peter mcfarlane too for that matter though peter sat away back as beseemed a modest functionary whose business was with the book and the bell altogether as horace williams leaned over to tell him it was like a knox church sociable he could feel completely at home and though the audience was by no means confined to knox church lorne did feel at home dora milburn's countenance he might perhaps have missed but dora was absent by arrangement mr milburn as the fight went on had shown himself so increasingly bitter to the point of writing letters in the mercury attacking wallingham and the liberal leaders of south fox that his daughter felt an insurmountable delicacy in attending even lorne's big meeting alfred hesketh meant to have gone 
but it was ten by the millburn's drawing-room clock before he remembered miss filkin actually did go and brought home a great report of it miss filkin would no more have missed a minister than she would a bishop but she was the only one lorne had prepared for this occasion for a long time it was certain to come the day of the supreme effort when he should make his final appeal under the most favorable circumstances that could be devised when the harassing work of the campaign would be behind him and nothing would remain but the luxury of one last strenuous call to arms the glory of that anticipation had been with him from the beginning and in the beginning he saw his great moment only in one character for weeks while he plodded through the details of the benefits south fox had received and might expect to receive at the hands of the liberal party he privately stored argument on argument piled phrase on phrase still further to advance and defend the imperial unity of his vision on this certain and special opportunity his jihad it would be for the faith and purpose of his race so he scanned it and heard it with conviction hot in him and impulse strong and intention noble then uneasiness had arisen as we know and under steady pressure he had daily drawn himself from these high intentions persuaded by bingham and the rest that they were not yet in shape to talk about so that his address on this memorable evening would have a different stamp from the one he designed in the early burning hours of his candidature he had postponed those matters under advice to the hour of practical dealing when a government which it would be his privilege to support would consider and carry them he put the notes of his original speech away in his office desk with solicitude it was indeed very thorough a grand marshalling of the facts and review of the principles involved and pigeonholed it in the chambers of his mind with the good hope to bring it forth another day then he devoted his attention to the history of liberalism in fox county both ridings were solid and it was upon the history of liberalism in fox county its triumphs and its fruits that he embarked so easily and so assuredly when he opened his address in the opera house that tuesday night who knows at what suggestion or even precisely at what moment the fabric of his sincere intention fell away bingham does not mr farquharson has the vaguest idea dr drummond declares that he expected it from the beginning but is totally unable to say why i can get nothing more out of them though they were all there though they all saw him indeed a dramatic figure standing for the youth and energy of the old blood and heard him as he slipped away into his great preoccupation as he made what bingham called his bad break his very confidence may have accounted for it he was off guard against the enemy and the more completely off guard against himself the history of liberalism in fox county offered no doubt some inlet to the rush of the idea for suddenly mr farquharson says he was off mr farquharson was on the platform and i can tell you said he i pricked up my ears they all did the idea came in upon such a personal note i claim it my great good fortune the young man was suddenly telling them in a note of curious gravity and concentration and however the fight goes i shall always claim it my great good fortune to have been identified at a critical moment with the political principles that are ennobled in this country by the imperialistic aim an intention a great purpose in the endless construction and reconstruction of the world will choose its own agency 
and the imperial design in canada has chosen the liberal party because the liberal party in this country is the party of the soil the land the nation as it springs from that which makes it a nation and imperialism is intensely and supremely a national affair ours is the policy of the fields we stand for the wheat belt and the stockyard the forest and the mine as the basic interests of the country we stand for the principles that make for nation building by the slow sweet processes of the earth cultivating the individual rooted man who draws his essence and his tissues from the soil and so by unhurried natural healthy growth labor sweating his vices out of him forms the character of the commonwealth the foundation of the state so the imperial idea seeks its canadian home in liberal councils the imperial idea is far-sighted england has outlived her own body apart from her heart and her history england is an area where certain trades are carried on still carried on in the scrolls of the future it is already written that the center of the empire must shift and where if not to canada there was a half comprehending burst of applause dr drummond's the first clap it was a curious change from the simple colloquial manner in which young murchison had begun and to which the audience were accustomed and on this account probably they stamped the harder they applauded lorne himself something from him infected them they applauded being made to feel like that they would clap first and consider afterward john murchison smiled with pleasure but shook his head bingham doubled up and clapping like a repeating rifle groaned aloud under cover of it to horace williams oh the darned kid a certain liberal peer of blessed political memory lorne continued with a humorous twist of his mouth on one of those graceful elegant academic occasions which offer political peers such happy opportunities of getting in their work over there had lately a vision which he described to his university audience of what might have happened if the american colonies had remained faithful to great britain a vision of monarch and ministers government and parliament departing solemnly for the other hemisphere they did not so remain so the noble peer may conjure up his vision or dismiss his nightmare as he chooses and it is safe to prophesy that no port of the united states will see that entry but remembering that the greater half of the continent did remain faithful the northern and strenuous half destined to move with sure steps and steady mind to greater growth and higher place among the nations than any of us can now imagine would it be as safe to prophesy that such a momentous sailing day will never be more than the after-dinner fantasy of aristocratic rhetoric is it not at least as easy to imagine that even now while the people of england send their viceroys to the ends of the earth and vote careless millions for a reconstructed army and sit in the wrecks of cabinets disputing whether they will eat our bread or the strangers the sails may be filling in the far harbor of time which will bear their descendants to a representative share of the duties and responsibilities of empire in the capital of the dominion of canada it was the boldest proposition and the liberal voters of the town of elgin blinked a little looking at it still they applauded hurriedly to get it over and hear what more might be coming bingham on the platform laughed heartily and conspicuously as if anybody could see that it was all an excellent joke lorn half turned to him with a gesture of protest then he went on if that transport ever left the shores of england we would go far some of us to meet it 
but for all the purposes that matter most it sailed long ago british statesmen could bring us nothing better than the ideals of british government and those we have had since we levied our first tax and made our first law that precious cargo was our heritage and we never threw it overboard but chose rather to render what impost it brought and there are those who say that the impost has been heavy though never a dollar was paid he paused for an instant and seemed to review and take account of what he had said he was hopelessly adrift from the subject he had proposed to himself launched for better or for worse upon the scheme that was subliminal in him and had flowed up on which he was launched and almost rudderless without construction and without control the speech of his first intention orderly developed was as far from him as the history of liberalism in fox county for an instant he hesitated and then under the suggestion no doubt of that ancient misbehavior in boston harbor at which he had hinted he took up another argument i will quote him a little let us hold he said simply to the empire let us keep this patrimony which has been ours for three hundred years let us not forget the flag we believe ourselves at this moment in no danger of forgetting it the day after pardeberg that still winter day did not our hearts rise within us to see it shaken out with its message everywhere shaken out against the snow how it spoke to us and lifted us the silent flag in the new fallen snow theirs and ours that was but a little while ago and there is not a man here who will not bear me out in saying that we were never more loyal in word and deed than we are now and that very state of things has created for us an undermining alternative so long as no force appeared to improve the trade relations between england and this country canada sought in vain to make commercial bargains with the united states they would have none of us or our produce they kept their wall just as high against us as against the rest of the world not a pine plank or a bushel of barley could we get over under a reciprocal arrangement but the imperial trade idea has changed the attitude of our friends to the south they have small liking for any scheme which will improve trade between great britain and canada because trade between great britain and canada must be improved at their expense and now you cannot take up an american paper without finding the report of some commercial association demanding closer trade relations with canada or an american magazine in which some far-sighted economist is not urging the same thing they see us thinking about keeping the business in the family with that hard american common sense that has made them what they are they accept the situation and at this moment they are ready to offer us better terms to keep our trade bingham horace williams and mr farquharson applauded loudly their young man frowned a little and squared his chin he was past hints of that kind and that he went on to say is on the surface a very satisfactory state of things no doubt a bargain between the americans and ourselves could be devised which would be a very good bargain on both sides in the absence of certain pressing family affairs it might be as well worth our consideration as we used to think it before we were invited to the family council but if any one imagines that any degree of reciprocity with the united states could be entered upon without killing the idea of british preference trade for all time let him consider what canada's attitude toward that idea would be to-day if the americans had consented to our proposals twenty-five years ago and we were invited to make an imperial sacrifice of the american trade that had prospered as it would have prospered for a quarter of a century i doubt whether the proposition would even be made to us but the alternative before canada is not 
a mere choice of markets we are confronted with a much graver issue in this matter of dealing with our neighbor our very existence is involved if we would preserve ourselves as a nation it has become our business not only to reject american overtures in favor of the overtures of our own great england but to keenly watch and actively resist american influence as it already threatens us through the common channels of life and energy we often say that we fear no invasion from the south but the armies of the south have already crossed the border american enterprise american capital is taking rapid possession of our mines and our water power our oil areas and our timber limits in today's dominion one paper alone you may read of charters granted to five industrial concerns with headquarters in the united states the trades unions of the two countries are already international american settlers are pouring into the wheat belt of the northwest and when the dominion of canada has paid the hundred million dollars she has just voted for a railway to open up the great lone northern lands between quebec and the pacific it will be the american farmer and the american capitalist who will reap the benefit they approach us today with all the arts of peace commercial missionaries to the ungathered harvests of neglected territories but the day may come when they will menace our coasts to protect their markets unless by firm resolved whole-hearted action now we keep our opportunities for our own people they cheered him promptly and a gathered intensity came into his face at the note of praise nothing on earth can hold him now said bingham as he crossed his arms upon a breast seething with practical politics and waited for the worst the question of the hour for us said lord murchison to his fellow townsmen curbing the strenuous note in his voice is deeper than any balance of trade can indicate wider than any department of statistics can prove we cannot calculate it in terms of pig iron or reduce it to any formula of consumption the question that underlies this decision for canada is that of the whole stamp and character of her future existence is that stamp and character to be impressed by the american republic effacing he smiled a little the old queen's head and the new king's oath or is it to be our own stamp and character acquired in the rugged discipline of our colonial youth and developed in the national usage of the british empire dr drummond clapped alone everybody else was listening it is ours he told them in this greater half of the continent to evolve a nobler ideal the americans from the beginning went in a spirit of revolt the seed of disaffection was in every puritan bosom we from the beginning went in a spirit of amity forgetting nothing disavowing nothing to plant the flag with our fortunes we took our very constitution our very chart of national life from england her laws her liberty her equity were good enough for us we have lived by them some of us have died by them and thank god we were long poor and this republic he went on hotly this republic that menaces our national life with commercial extinction what past has she that is comparable the daughter who left the old stock to be the light woman among nations welcoming all comers mingling her pure blood polluting her lofty ideals until it is hard indeed to recognize the features and the aims of her honorable youth allowance will be made for the intemperance of his figure he believed himself you see at the bar for the life of a nation let us not hesitate to announce ourselves for the empire to throw all we are and all we have into the balance for that great decision 
the seers of political economy tell us that if the stars continue to be propitious it is certain that a day will come which will usher in a union of the anglo-saxon nations of the world as between england and the united states the prominent partner in that firm will be the one that brings canada so that the imperial movement of the hour may mean even more than the future of the motherland may reach even farther than the boundaries of great britain again he paused and his eye ranged over their listening faces he had them all with him his words were vivid in their minds the truth of them stood about him like an atmosphere even bingham looked at him without reproach but he had done ladies and gentlemen he said his voice dropping with a hint of tiredness to another level i have the honor to stand for your suffrages as candidate in the liberal interest for the riding of south fox in the dominion house of commons the day after to-morrow i solicit your support and i hereby pledge myself to justify it by every means in my power but it would be idle to disguise from you that while i attach all importance to the immediate interests in charge of the liberal party and if elected shall use my best efforts to further them the great task before that party in my opinion the overshadowing task to which i shall hope in my place and degree to stand committed from the beginning is the one which i have endeavored to bring before your consideration this evening they gave him a great appreciation and mr cruikshank following spoke in complimentary terms of the eloquent appeal made by the young and vigorous protagonist of the imperial cause but proceeded to a number of quite other and apparently more important grounds why he should be elected the hon mr tellier's speech the minister was always kept to the last was a defense of the recent dramatic development of the government's railway policy and a reminder of the generous treatment elgin was receiving in the estimates for the following year thirty thousand dollars for a new drill hall and fifteen thousand for improvements to the post office it was a telling speech with the chink of hard cash in every sentence a kind of audit by a chartered accountant of the liberal books of south fox showing good sound reason why the liberal candidate should be returned on thursday if only to keep the balance right the audience listened with practical satisfaction that's tellier all over they said to one another the effect in committee of what in spite of the hon mr tellier's participation i must continue to call the speech of the evening may be gathered from a brief colloquy between mr bingham and mr williams in the act of separating at the door of the opera house i don't know what it was worth to preference trade said bingham but it wasn't worth a hill of beans to his own election he had as soft a snap returned horace williams on the brink of tears as soft a snap as anybody ever had in this town and he's monkeyed it all away all away both the local papers published the speech in full the following day if there's anything in manchester or birmingham that mr lorne murchison would like commented the mercury editorially we understand he has only to call for it end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the milburns doorbell rang very early the morning of the election the family and alfred hesketh were just sitting down to breakfast mr hesketh was again the guest of the house he had taken a run out to vancouver with mr milburn's partner who had gone to settle a point or two in connection with the establishment of a branch there the points had been settled and hesketh having learned more than ever had returned to elgin 
the maid came back into the room with a conscious air and said something in a low voice to dora who flushed and frowned a little and asked to be excused as she left the room a glance of intelligence passed between her and her mother while miss milburn was generally thought to be most like her father both in appearance and disposition there were points upon which she could count on an excellent understanding with her other parent oh lorne she said having carefully closed the drawing-room door what in the world have you come here for to-day of all days did anybody see you the young man standing tall and broad-shouldered before the mantelpiece had yet a look of expecting reproach i don't know he said humbly i don't think father would like it dora told him if he knew you were here why we're having an early breakfast on purpose to let him get out and work for winter i never saw him so excited over an election to think of your coming to-day he made a step toward her i came because it is to-day he said only for a minute dear it's a great day for me you know whether we win or lose i wanted you to be in it i wanted you to wish me good luck but you know i always do she objected yes i know but a fellow likes to hear it dora on the day you know and i've seen so little of you lately she looked at him measuringly you're looking awfully thin she exclaimed with sudden compunction i wish you had never got into this horrid campaign i wish they had nominated somebody else Lorne smiled half bitterly i shouldn't wonder if a few other people wished the same thing he said but i'm afraid they'll have to make the best of it now dora had not sanctioned his visit by sitting down and as he came nearer to her she drew a step away moving by instinct from the capture of the lover but he had made little of that and almost as he spoke was at her side she had to yield her hands to him well you'll win it for them if anybody could she assured him say win it for us dear she shook her head i'm not a liberal yet she said laughing it's only a matter of time i'll never be converted to grit politics no but you'll be converted to me he told her and drew her nearer i'm going now dora i dare say i shouldn't have come every minute counts to-day good-bye she could not withhold her face from his asking lips and he had bent to take his privilege when a step in the hall threatened and divided them it's only mr hesketh going upstairs said dora with relief i thought it was father oh lorn fly hesketh young murchison's face clouded is he working for winter too lorn what a thing to ask when you know he believes in your ideas but he's a conservative at home you see so he says he's in an awkward position and he has been taking perfectly neutral ground lately he hasn't a vote anyway no said lorn he's of no consequence the familiar easy step in the house of his beloved the house he was being entreated to leave with all speed struck upon his heart and his nerves she with her dull surface to the more delicate vibrations of things failed to perceive this or perhaps she would have thought it worth while to find some word to bring back his peace she disliked seeing people unhappy when she was five years old and her kitten broke its leg she had given it to a servant to drown he took his hat making no further attempt to caress her and opened the door i hope you will win lorne she said half resentfully and he with forced cheerfulness replied oh we'll have a shot at it then with a little silent nod at her which notwithstanding her provocations conveyed his love and trust he went out into the struggle of the day in spite of squire ormiston's confident prediction it was known that the fight would be hottest among the townships in moneda reservation elgin itself of course would lead the van for excitement 
would be the real theatre for the arts of practical politics but things would be pretty warm in moneda too it was for that reason that bingham and the rest strongly advised lorne not to spend too much of the day in the town but to get out to moneda early and to drive around with ormiston stick to him like a fly to poison paper you leave elgin to your friends said bingham just show your face here and there wearing a smile of triumph to encourage the crowd but don't worry about the details we'll attend to them we can't have him upsettin his own election by any interference with the boys said bingham to horace williams he's got too long a nose for all kinds of things to be comfortable in town to-day he'll do a great deal less harm trotting round the reserve braced up against old ormiston so elgin was left to the capable hands of the boys for the furtherance of the liberal interest and the sacred cause of imperialism mr farquharson whose experience was longer and whose nose presumably shorter than the candidates never abandoned the town ward bingham skirmished between the polling booths and the committee room horace williams was out all day rawlins edited the paper the returns wouldn't be ready in time for anything but an extra anyhow and the stand to arms south fox leader had been written two days ago the rest was millinery or might be for all anybody would read of it the other side had a better idea of the value of their candidate than to send him into the country walter winter remained where he was most effective and most at home he had a neat little livery outfit and he seemed to spend the whole day in it accompanied by intimate personal friends who had never spoken to him much less driven with him before two or three strangers arrived the previous night at the leading hotels their business was various but they had one point in common they were very solicitous about their personal luggage i should be sorry to assign their politics and none of them seem to know much about the merits of the candidates so they are not perhaps very pertinent except for the curiosity shown by the public at the spectacle of gentlemen carrying their own bags when there were porters to do it it was a day long remembered and long quoted the weather was spring-like sun after a week's thaw it was pleasant to be abroad in the relaxed air and the drying streets that here and there sent up threads of steam after the winter house-cleaning of their wooden sidewalks voting was a privilege never unappreciated in elgin and to-day the weather brought out every soul to the poles the ladies of his family waiting in many instances on the veranda with shawls over their heads to hear the report of how the fight was going abby saw dr harry back in his consulting-room and dr henry safely off to vote and then took the two children and went over to her father's house because she simply could not endure the suspense anywhere else the adventurous stella picketed herself at a corner near the empty grocery which served as a polling booth for subdivision eleven one of the most doubtful but was forced to retire at the sight of the first carryall full of men from the millburn boiler company flaunting a banner inscribed we are solid for w w met in the hall by her sister she protested that she hadn't cried till she got inside the gate anyhow abby lectured her soundly on the want of proper pride she was much too big a girl to be seen around on a day when her brother was running if it were only for school trustee the other ladies of the family having acquired proper pride kept in the back of the house so as not to be tempted to look out of the front windows mrs murchison assumed a stoical demeanour and made a pudding though there was no reason to help eliza who was sufficiently lacking in proper pride to ask the milkman whether lorne wasn't sure to be elected down there now the milkman said he guessed the best man had get in but in a manner which roused general suspicion as to which he had himself favoured 
we'll finish the month said mrs murchison and then not another quart do we take from him a gentleman that's so uncertain when he's asked a simple question the butcher came and brought a jovial report without being asked for it said he was the first man to hand in a paper at his place but they were piling up there in great shape for mr murchison when he left if he gets in he gets in said mrs murchison and if he doesn't it won't be because of not deserving to those were real nice cutlets yesterday mr price and you had better send us a sirloin for to-morrow about six pounds but it doesn't matter to an ounce and you can save us sweetbreads for sunday i like yours better than luff's john murchison alec and oliver came shortly up to dinner bringing stirring tales from the field there was the personator in subdivision six of a dead man a dead grit wanted by the bloodhounds of the other side and tracked to the reform committee room where he was ostensibly and publicly taking refuge why did he go there asked stella breathlessly why to make it look like a put-up job of ours of course said her brother and it was a put-up job a good old tory fake but they didn't calculate on bingham and bingham's memory bingham happened to be in the committee room and he recognized this fellow for a regular political tough from up muskoka way where they get six for a bottle of canadian and ten if it's scotch why good morning says bingham thought you were in jail and just then he catches sight of a couple of trailers from the window well bingham isn't just lightning smart but then he isn't slow you know well he says you can't stop here and in another second he was throwing the fellow out threw him out pretty hard too i guess right down the stairs and bingham on top met winter's men at the door the next time you want information from the headquarters of this association gentlemen bingham said send somebody respectable bingham thought the man was just any kind of low spy at first but when they claimed him for personation bingham just laughed don't be so hard on your friends he said i don't think we'll hear much more about that little racket can't anything be done to any of them asked stella not to-day of course but when there's time we'll have to see about it stella said alec when there's time talking about bingham oliver told them you know bingham's story about jim whalen keeping sober for two weeks for the first time in twenty years to vote for winter wouldn't touch a thing no he was going to do it this time if he died for it it was disagreeable to refuse drinks but it was going to be worth his while been boasting about the post office janitorship winter was to give him if he got in well in he came to number eleven this morning all dressed up with a clean collar looking thirstier than any man you ever saw and gets his paper young charlie bingham is deputy returning officer at number eleven in a second back comes whalen this ballot's marked he says you don't fool me is it says charlie taking it out of his hand that's very wrong jim you shouldn't have marked it and drops it in the ballot box oh jim was wild the paper had gone in blank you see and he'd lost all those good drunks and his vote too he was going to have charlie's blood right away but there it was done he'd handed in his ballot he couldn't have another they all laughed i fear at the unfortunate plight of the two suspicious whalen why did he think the ballot was marked asked edvina oh there was a little smudge on it a fly spot or something charlie says but you couldn't fool whalen i hope said stella meditatively that lorne will get in by more than one he wouldn't like to owe his election to a low-down trick like that don't you be at all alarmed you little girlish thing replied her brother lorne will get in by five hundred john murchison had listened to their excited talk mostly in silence going on with his dinner as if that and nothing else were the important matter of the moment mrs murchison had had this idiosyncrasy of his to put up with for over thirty years she bore it now as long as she could father 
she exploded at last do you think lorne will get in by five hundred mr murchison shook his head and bestowed his whole attention upon the paring of an apple if he kept his hopes to himself he also kept his doubts that remains to be seen he said well considering it's your own son i think you might show a little more confidence said mrs murchison no thank you no dessert for me with a member of the family being elected or not for a seat in parliament i'm not the one to want dessert between mr murchison and the milkman that morning mrs murchison felt almost too much tried by the superior capacity for reticence it was seven in the evening before the ballot boxes were all in the hands of the sheriff and nine before that officer found it necessary to let the town know that it had piled up a majority of three hundred for walter winter he was not a supporter of walter winter and he preferred to wait until the returns began to come in from clayfield and the townships in the hope that they would make the serious difference that was required of them the results were flashed one after the other to the total from the windows of the express and the mercury upon the cheering crowd that gathered in market square there were moments of wild elation moments of deep suspense upon both sides but when the final addition and subtraction was made the enthusiastic voters of south fox including jim whalen who had neglected no further opportunity read with yells and groans hurrahs and catcalls that they had elected mr lorn murchison to the dominion house of commons by a majority of seventy then the band began to play and all the tin whistles to rejoice young and windle had the grace to blow their sirens and across the excited darkness of the town came the long familiar boom of the murchison stove-works every liberal in elgin who had any means of making a noise made it from the window of the association committee room their young fellow townsmen thanked them for the honor they had done him while his mother sat in the cab he had brought her down in and applauded vigorously between tears and his father took congratulations from a hundred friendly hands they all went home in a torchlight procession the band always playing the tin whistles always performing and it was two in the morning before the occasion could in any sense be said to be over lights burned quite as late however in the conservative committee room where matters were being arranged to bark threateningly at the heels of victory next day victory looked like something that might be made to turn and parley a majority of seventy was too small for finality her attention was called without twenty-four hours delay to a paragraph in the elgin mercury plainly authoritative to the effect that the election of mr murchison would be immediately challenged on the ground of the infringement in the electoral district of moneda of certain provisions of the ontario elections act with the knowledge and consent of the candidate whose claim to the contested seat it was confidently expected would be rendered within a very short time null and void End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary you can never trust an indian said mrs murchison at the anxious family council well do i remember them when you were a little thing at vena hanging round the town on a market day and the squaws coming to the back door with their tin pails of raspberries to sell and just knowing english enough to ask a big price for them but it was on the squaws we depended in those days or go without raspberry preserves for the winter slovenly looking things they were with their three or four colored petticoats and their papooses on their backs and for dirt but i thought they were all gone long ago there are enough of them left to make trouble all right said alec 
they don't dress up like they used to and i guess they send the papooses to kindergarten now but you'll find plenty of them lying around any time there's nothing to do but vote and get drunk allowing for the natural exaggeration of partisanship the facts about the remaining red man of moneda were much as aleck described them on market days he slid easily unless you looked twice into what the express continues to call the farming community invariably if you did look twice you would note that his stiff felt hat was an inch taller in the crown than those worn generally by the farming community the pathetic assertion perhaps of an old sovereignty invariably too his coat and trousers betrayed a form within which in the effort at adaptation had become high-shouldered and lank of leg and the brown skin was there to be noticed though you might pass it by and the high cheekbones and the liquidly muddy eye he had taken on the signs of civilization at the level which he occupied the farming community had lent him its look of shrewdness in small bargains and its rakish sophistication in garments nor could you always assume with certainty except at fox county fairs and elections that he was intoxicated so much government had done for him in fox county where the reservation nursing the dying fragment of his race testified that there is such a thing as political compunction out in the wide spaces of the west he still protects his savagery they know an indian there to-day as far as they can see him without a second glance and in moneda upon polling days he still as aleck said made trouble perhaps it would be more to the fact to say that he presented the elements of which trouble is made civilization had given him a vote not with his coat and trousers but shortly after and he had not yet learned to keep it anywhere but in his pocket whence the transfer was easy and could be made in different ways the law contemplated only one the straight drop into the ballot-box but the boys had other views the law represented one level of political sentiment the boys represented another both parties represented the law both parties were represented by the boys and on the occasion of the south fox election the boys had been active in moneda there are as we know two kinds of activity on these occasions one being set to observe the other and walter winter's boys while presumably neglecting no legitimate opportunity of their own claimed to have been highly successful in detecting the methods of the other side the indians owed their holdings their allowances their school and their protecting superintendent squire ormiston to a conservative government it made a grateful bond of which a later conservative government was not perhaps unaware when it added the ballot to its previous benefits the indians therefore on election days were supposed to go solid for the candidate in whom they had been taught to see good will if they did not go quite solid the other side might point to the evolution of the political idea in every dissentient a gladdening spectacle indeed on which however the other side seldom showed any desire to dwell hitherto the desires and intentions of the reserve had been exemplified in its superintendent squire ormiston had never led his wards to the polls there were strong reasons against that but the squire made no secret of his politics either before or unluckily after he changed them the indians had always known that they were voting on the same side as de boss they were likely the friends of mr winter thought to know now that they were voting on a different side this was the secret of mr winter's friend's unusual diligence on voting day in moneda the mere indication of a wish 
on the part of the superintendent would constitute undue influence in the eye of the law the squire was not the most discreet of men often before it had been the joke of conservative counsels how near the old man had come to making a case for the grits in connection with this chief or that i will not say that he was acquainted with the famous letter from queen victoria affectionately bidding her indian children to vote for the conservative candidate but perhaps he had not adhered to the strictest interpretation of the law which gave him fatherly influence in everything pertaining to his red-skinned charge's interests temporal and spiritual excepting only their sacred privilege of the ballot he may even have held it in some genial derision their sacred privilege it would be natural if he had been there among them in unquestioned authority so long now it had assumed an importance the squire looked at it with the ardour of a converted eye when he told mr farquharson that he could bring maneda with him to a liberal victory he thought and spoke of the farmers of the township not of his wards of the reserve yet as the day approached these would infallibly become voters in his eyes to swell or to diminish the sum of maneda's loyalty to the empire they remembered all this in the committee-room of his old party the squire they said to one another will give himself away this time if ever he did then young murchison hadn't known any better than to spend the best part of the day out there and there were a dozen witnesses to swear that old ormiston introduced him to three or four of the chiefs that was basis enough for the boys detailed to watch maneda basis enough in the end for a petition constructed to travel to the high court at toronto for the purpose of rendering null and void the election of mr lorne murchison and transferring the south fox seat to the candidate of the opposite party that possibility had been promptly frustrated by a cross petition there was enough evidence in subdivision eleven according to bingham to void the tory returns on six different counts but the house cat sold by peter finnegan to mr winter for five dollars would answer all practical purposes it was a first-rate mouser bingham said and it would settle winter they would have plenty of other charges good and ready if finnegan's cat should fail them but bingham didn't think the court would get to anything else he had great confidence in the cat the petitions had been lodged with promptness evidence as mr winter remarked is like a good many other things better when it's hot especially the kind you get on the reserve to which when he heard it bingham observed sarcastically that the cat would keep the necessary thousand dollars were ready on each side the day after the election lodged in court the next counsel were as promptly engaged the liberals selected cruikshank and the suit against the elected candidate beginning with charges against his agents in the town was shortly in full hearing before the judges sent from toronto to try it meanwhile the elgin mercury had shown enterprise in getting hold of maneda evidence and foolhardiness as the express pointed out in publishing it before the matter was reached in court there was no foolhardiness in printing what the express knew about finnegan's cat it was just a common cat and walter winter paid five dollars for it finnegan declaring that if mr winter hadn't filled him up with bad whisky before the bargain he wouldn't have let her go under ten he was that fond of the creature the express pointed out that this was grasping of finnegan as the cat had never left him and mr winter showed no intention of taking her away but there was nothing sub judice about the cat finnegan before he sobered up had let her completely out of the bag it was otherwise with the charges that were to be made according to the mercury on the evidence of chief joseph fry and another member of his tribe to the effect that he and his conservative friends 
had been instructed by squire ormiston and mr murchison to vote on this occasion for both the candidates thereby producing when the box was opened eleven ballot papers inscribed with two crosses instead of one and valueless here should the charges against a distinguished and highly respected government official fail as in the opinion of the express they undoubtedly would fail of substantiation was a big libel case all dressed and ready and looking for the mercury office foolish foolish wrote mr williams at the close of his editorial comments very ill-advised they've made no case so far mr murchison assured the family i saw williams on my way up and he says the evidence of that corner grocery fellow what's his name went all to pieces this morning oliver was in court he says one of the judges hook lost his patience altogether they won't do anything with the town charges alec said and they know it they're saving themselves for maneda and old man ormiston well i heartily wish said mrs murchison in a tone of grievance with the world at large and if you were not responsible you might keep out of the way i heartily wish that lorne had stayed at home that day and not got mixed up with old man ormiston they'll find it pretty hard to fix anything on lorne said alec but i guess the squire did go off his head a little have they anything more than indian evidence asked edvina we don't know what they've got said her brother darkly and we won't till wednesday when they expect to get round to it indian evidence will be a poor dependence in crookshank's hands mr murchison told them with a chuckle they say this chief joseph fry is going about complaining that he always got three dollars for one vote before and this time he expected six for two and got nothing chief joseph fry exclaimed alec they make me tired with their chief josephs and chief henry's white clamshell that was the name he got when he wasn't christened that's the name remarked edvina that he probably votes under well said mrs murchison it was very kind of squire ormiston to give lorne his support but it seems to me that as far as moneda is concerned he would have done better alone no i guess he wouldn't mother said alec moneda came right round with the squire outside the reserve if it hadn't been for the majority there we would have lost the election the old man worked hard and lorne is grateful to him and so he ought to be if they carry the case against lorne said stella he'll be disqualified for seven years only if they prove him personally mixed up in it said the father and that he added with a concentration of family sentiment in the emphasis of it they'll not do End of chapter 31chapter thirty two of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary it was late afternoon when the train from the west deposited hugh finley upon the elgin platform the close of one of those wide wet uncertain february days when the call of spring is on the wind though spring is weeks away the lights of the town flashed and glimmered down the streets under the bare swaying maple branches the early evening was full of soft bluster the air was conscious with an appeal of nature vague yet poignant the young man caught at the strange sympathy that seemed to be abroad for his spirit he walked to his house courting it troubled by it they were expecting him that evening at dr drummond's and there it was his intention to go but on his way he would call for a moment to see edvina murchison he had something to tell her it would be news of interest at dr drummond's also but it was of no consequence within an hour or so when they should receive it there 
while it was of great consequence that Edvina should hear it at the earliest opportunity, and from him. There is no weighing or analyzing the burden of such a necessity as this. It simply is important. It makes its own weight, and those whom it concerns must put aside other matters until it has been accomplished. He would tell her. They would accept it for a moment together, a moment during which he would also ascertain whether she was well and strong, with the good chance of happiness, God protect her, in the future that he should not know. Then he would go on to Dr. Drummond's. The wind had risen when he went out again. It blew a longer blast, and the trees made a steady, sonorous rhythm in it. The sky was full of clouds that dashed upon the track of a failing moon. There was portent everywhere, and a hint of tumult at the end of the street. No two ways led from Finley's house to his first destination. River Street made an angle with that on which the Murchisons lived, half a mile to the corner and three-quarters the other way. Drops drove in his face as he strode along against the wind, stilling his unquiet heart that leaped before him to that brief interview as he took the single turning he came into the full blast of the veering irresolute storm the street was solitary and full of the sound of the blown trees wild and uplifting far down the figure of a woman wavered before the wind across the zone of a blurred lamp-post she was coming toward him he bent his head and lowered his umbrella and lost sight of her as they approached she with the storm behind her driven with hardly more resistance than the last year's blackened leaves that blew with her he assailed by it and making the best way he could certainly the wind was taking her part and his when in another moment her skirt whipped against him and he saw her face glimmer out a mere wreck of lines and shadows it seemed in the livid light with suddenly perceiving eyes and lips that cried his name she had on a hat and a cloak but carried no umbrella and her hands were bare and wet pitifully the storm blew her into his arms a tossed and straying thing that could not speak for sobs pitifully and with a rough incoherent sound he gathered and held her in that refuge a rising fear and a great solicitude laid a finger upon his craving embrace of her he had a sense of something strangely different in her of the unknown irremediable yet she was there in his arms as she had never been before her plight but made her in a manner sweeter the storm that brought her barricaded them in the empty spaces of the street with a divinely entreating solitude he had been prepared to meet her in the lighted decorum of her father's house and he knew what he should say he was not prepared to take her out of the tempest helpless and weeping and lost for the harbour of his heart and nothing could he say he locked his lips against all that came murmuring to them but his arms tightened about her and he drew her into the shelter of a wall that jutted out in the irregular street and there they stood and clung together in a long close broken silence that covered the downfall of her spirit it was the moment of their great experience of one another never again in whatever crisis could either know so deep so wonderful a fathoming of the other soul once as it passed edvina put up her hand and touched his cheek there were tears on it and she trembled and wound her arm about his neck and held up her face to his no he muttered and crushed it against his breast there without complaint she let it lie she was all submission to him his blood leaped and his spirit groaned with the knowledge of it why did you come out why did you come dear he said at last i don't know there was such a wind i could not stay in the house 
she spoke timidly in a voice that should have been new to him but that it was above all her voice i was on my way to you i know i thought you might perhaps come if you had not i think i was on my way to you it seemed not unnatural did you find any message from me when you came she asked presently in a quieted almost a contented tone it shot the message before his eyes though he had seen it no message in the preoccupation of his arrival i found a rose on my dressing-table he told her and the rose stood for him in a wonder of tenderness looking back i smuggled it in she confessed i knew your old servant she used to be with us the others from dr drummond's have been there all day making it warm and comfortable for you i had no right to do anything like that but i had the right hadn't i to bring the rose i don't know he answered her hard-pressed how we are to bear this she shrank away from him a little as if at a glimpse of a surgeon's knife we are not to bear it she said eagerly the rose is to tell you that i didn't mean it when i left it to be anything more more than a rose but now i do i didn't even know when i came out to-night but now i do we aren't to bear it hugh i don't want it so now i can't can't have it so she came nearer to him again and caught with her two hands the lapels of his coat he closed his arm over them and looked down at her in that half detachment which still claimed and held her Advina, he whispered out of the sudden clamour in his mind she can't be she isn't nothing has happened to her she smiled faintly but her eyes were again full of fear at his implication of the only way oh no she said but you have been away and she has come i have seen her and oh she won't care hugh she won't care her asking straining face seemed to gather and reflect all the light there was in the shifting night about them the rain had stopped but the wind still hurtled past whirling the leaves from one darkness to another they were as isolated as outlawed there in the wild wet wind as they were in the confusion of their own souls we must care he said helplessly clinging to the sound and form of the words oh no she cried no no indeed i know now what is possible and what is not for an instant her eyes searched the rigid lines of his face in astonishment in their struggle to establish the impossible she had been so far ahead so greatly the more confident and daring had tempted him to such heights scorning every dizzy verge that now when she turned quite back from their adventure humbly confessing it too hard she could not understand how he should continue to set himself doggedly toward it perhaps too she trusted unconsciously in her prerogative he loved her and she him before she would not now she would before she had preferred an ideal to the desire of her heart now it lay about her her strenuous heart had pulled it down to foolish ruin and how should she lie abased with it and see him still erect and full of the deed they had to do come he said let me take you home dear and at that and some accent in it that struck again at hope she sank at his feet in a torrent of weeping clasping them and entreating him oh send her away send her away he lifted her and was obliged literally to support her her hat had fallen off 
he stroked her hair and murmured such comfort to her as we have for children in their extremity of which the burden is chiefly love and don't cry she grew gradually quieter drawing one knows not what restitution from the intrinsic in him but there was no pride in her and when she said let me go home now it was the broken word of hapless defeat they struggled together out into the boisterous street and once or twice she failed and had to stop and turn then she would cling to a wall or a tree putting his help aside with a gesture in which there was again some pitiful trace of renunciation they went almost without a word each treading upon the heart of the other toward the gulf that was to come they reached it at the murchison's gate and there they paused as briefly as possible since pause was torture and he told her what he could not tell her before i have accepted the charge of the whitewater mission station in alberta he said i too learned very soon after i left you what was possible and what was not i go as soon as things can be set in order here good-bye my dear love and may god help us both she looked at him with a pitiful effort at a steady lip i must try to believe it she said and afterward when it comes true for you remember this i was ashamed then he saw her pass into her father's house and he took the road to his duty and dr drummond's his extremity was very great through it lines came to him from the beautiful archaic inheritance of his church he strode along hearing them again and again in the dying storm so i do stretch my hands to thee my help alone thou only understands all my complaint and moan he listened to the prayer on the wind which seemed to offer it for him listened and was gravely touched but he himself was far from the throes of supplication he was looking for the forces of his soul and by the time he reached dr drummond's door we may suppose that he had found them sarah who let him in cried how wet you are mr finlay and took his overcoat to dry in the kitchen the scotch ladies she told him and mrs forsyth had gone out to tea but they would be back right away and meanwhile the doctor was expecting him in the study he knew the way finlay did know the way but as a matter of fact there had been time for him to forget it he had not crossed dr drummond's threshold since the night on which the doctor had done all as he would have said that was humanly possible to bring him finlay to reason upon the matter of his incredible entanglement in brass the door at the end of the passage was ajar however as if impatient and dr drummond himself standing in it heightened that appearance with his come you in finlay come you in the doctor looked at the young man in a manner even more acute more shrewd and more kindly than was his wont his eye searched finlay thoroughly and his smile seemed to broaden as his glance travelled man he said you're shivering and rolled him into an armchair near the fire the fellow came into the room he would say when he told the story afterward to the person most concerned as if he were going to the stake this is extraordinary weather we are having but i think the storm is passing over i hope said finlay that my aunt and miss cameron are well i understand they are out oh very well finally they're out at present and you'll see them by and by an excellent voyage over they had just the eight days but we'll be doing it in less than that when the new fast line is running to halifax but four days of actual ocean travelling they say now it will take four days from imperial shore to shore that should incorporate us that should bring them out and take us home 
the doctor had not taken a seat himself but was pacing the study his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets and a touch of embarrassment seemed added to the inveterate habit i hear the ladies had pleasant weather finlay remarked capital capital you won't smoke i know nothing about these cigars there's some grant left behind him a chimney that man grant well finlay he threw himself into the armchair on the other side of the hearth i don't know what to say to you surely said finlay restively it has all been said sir no it has not all been said dr drummond retorted no it has not there's more to be said and you must hear it finlay with such patience as you have but i speak the truth when i say that i don't know how to begin the young man gave him the opportunity gazing silently into the fire he was hardly aware that dr drummond had again left his seat when he started violently at a clap on the shoulder finlay exclaimed the doctor you won't be offended no you couldn't be offended it was half jocular half anxious wholly inexplicable at what asked hugh finlay should i be offended again with a deep sigh the doctor dropped into his chair i see i must begin at the beginning he said but finlay with sudden intuition had risen and stood before him trembling with a hand against the mantelpiece no he said if you have anything to tell me of importance for god's sake begin at the end some vibration in his voice went straight to the heart of the doctor banishing as it travelled every irrelevant thing that it encountered then the end is this finlay he said the young woman miss christie cameron whom you were so wilfully bound and determined to marry has thrown you over that is if you will give her back her word has jilted you that is if you'll let her away has thought entirely better of the matter he stared out of his great sockets of eyes as if the sky had fallen dr drummond would say recounting it for for what reason asked finlay hardly yet able to distinguish between the sound of disaster and the sense that lay beneath may i begin at the beginning asked the doctor and hugh silently nodded he sat there and never took his eyes off me twisting his fingers i might have been in a confession box dr drummond would explain to her she came here miss cameron with that good woman mrs kilbannon it will be three weeks next monday he said with all the air of beginning a story that would be well worth hearing and i wasn't very well pleased to see her for reasons that you know however that's neither here nor there i met them both at the station and i own to you that i thought when i made miss cameron's acquaintance that you were getting better than you deserved in the circumstances you were a thousand miles away now that was a fortunate thing and she and mrs kilbannon just stayed here and made themselves as comfortable as they could and that was so comfortable that anyone could see with half an eye the doctor's own eye twinkled so far as miss cameron was concerned that she wasn't pining in any sense of the word but i wasn't sorry for you finlay on that account he stopped to laugh enjoyingly and finlay blushed like a girl i just let matters bide and went about my own business though after poor mrs forsyth here a good woman enough but the brains of a rabbit it was pleasant to find these intelligent ladies at every meal and wonderful how quick they were at picking up the differences between the points of church administration here and at home that was a thing i noticed particularly in miss cameron matters went smoothly enough smoothly enough till one afternoon that foolish creature at vena murchison finlay started came here to pay a call on miss cameron and mrs kilbannon it was well and kindly meant but it was not a wise-like thing to do 
i didn't exactly make it out but it seems that she came all because of you and on account of you and the ladies didn't understand it and mrs kilbannon came to me my word but there was a woman to deal with who was this young lady and what was she to you that she should go anywhere or do anything in your name without doubt he put up a staying hand it was foolish of edvina and what sort of freedom and how far and why and what way and i tell you it was no easy matter to quiet her is miss cameron distressed about it said i not a bit said she but i am and i must have the rights of this matter said she if i have to put it to my nephew himself it was at that point finlay that the idea just then that the thought came into my mind well i won't say absolutely but practically for the first time why can't this matter be arranged on a basis to suit all parties so i said to her mrs kilbannon i said if you had reasonable grounds for it do you think you could persuade your niece not to marry hugh finlay wait patience he held up his hand and finlay gripped the arm of his chair again she just stared at me are you gone clean daft dr drummond she said there could be no grounds serious enough for that i will not believe that hugh finlay has compromised himself in any way i had to stop her i was obliged to tell her there was nothing of the kind nothing of the kind and later on i'll have to settle with my conscience about that i meant i said the reasonable grounds of an alternative an alternative said she to cut a long story short continued the doctor leaning forward always with the finger in his waistcoat pocket to emphasize what he said i represented to mrs kilbannon that miss cameron was not in sentimental relations toward you that she had some reason to suspect you of having placed your affections elsewhere and that i myself was very much taken up with what i had seen of miss cameron in brief i said to mrs kilbannon that if miss cameron saw no objection to altering the arrangements to admit of it i should be pleased to marry her myself the thing was much more suitable in every way i was fifty-three years of age last week i told her but i said miss cameron is thirty-six or seven if she's a day and finlay there would be like nothing but a grown-up son to her i can offer her a good home and the minister's pew in a church that any woman might be proud of and though far be it from me i said to depreciate mission work either home or foreign miss cameron in that field would be little less than thrown away think it over i said well she was pleased i could see that but she didn't half like the idea of changing the original notion it was leaving you to your own devices that weighed most with her against it she'd set her heart on seeing you married with her approval so i said to her to make an end of it well mrs kilbannon i said suppose we say no more about it for the present i think i see the finger of providence in this matter but you'll talk it over with miss cameron and we'll all just make it for the next few days the subject of quiet and sober reflection maybe at the end of that time i'll think better of it myself though that is not my expectation i think she said we'll just leave it to christie as the doctor went on with his tale relaxation had stolen dumbly about finlay's brow and lips he dropped from the plane of his own absorption to the humorous common sense of the recital it claimed and held him with infinite solace his eyes had something like the light of laughter in them flashing behind a cloud as he fixed them on dr drummond and said and did you we did said dr drummond getting up once more from his chair and playing complacently with his watch charms as he took another turn about the study we left it to miss cameron and the result is the doctor stopped sharply and wheeled round upon finlay 
the result is why the upshot seems to be that i've cut you out man finlay measured the little doctor standing there twisting his watch chain beaming with achieved satisfaction in a consuming desire to know how far chance had been kind to him and how far he had to be simply unspeakably grateful he stared in silence occupied with his great debt it was like him that that and not his liberty should be first in his mind we who have not his opportunity may find it more difficult to decide but from our private knowledge of dr drummond we may remember what poor finlay probably forgot at the moment that even when pitted against providence the doctor was a man of great determination the young fellow got up still speechless and confronted dr drummond he was troubled for something to say the chambers of his brain seemed empty or reiterating foolish sounds he pressed the hand the minister offered him and his lips quivered then a light came into his face and he picked up his hat and i'll say this for myself chuckled dr drummond it was no hard matter finlay looked at him and smiled it would not be sir he said lamely dr drummond cast a shrewd glance at him and dropped the tone of banter ay i know it's no joking matter he said and with a hand behind the young man's elbow he half pushed him to the door and took out his watch he must always be starting somebody something in the right direction the doctor it's not much after half-past nine finlay he said i notice the stars are out it had the feeling of a colloquial benediction and finlay carried it with him all the way it was nevertheless nearly ten when he reached her father's house so late that the family had dispersed for the night yet he had the hardihood to ring and the hour blessed them both for edvina on the stair catching who knows what of presage out of the sound turned and found him at the threshold herself End of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of the Imperialist by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. I understand how you must feel in the matter, Murchison, said Henry Cruikshank. It's the most natural thing in the world that you should want to clear yourself definitely, especially, as you say, since the charges have been given such wide publicity on the other hand i think it quite possible that you exaggerate the inference that will be drawn from our consenting to saw off with the other side on the two principal counts the inference will be said lorne that there's not a pin to choose between winter's political honesty and my own i'm no pharisee but i don't think i can sit down under that i can't impair my possible usefulness by accepting a slur upon my reputation at the very beginning politics are very impersonal it wouldn't be remembered a year winter of course said young murchison moodily doesn't want to take any chances he knows he's done for if we go on seven years for him would put him pretty well out of politics and it would suit him down to the ground to fight it over again there's nothing he would like better to see than another writ for south fox that's all right the lawyer responded but maneda doesn't look altogether pleasant you know we may have good grounds for supposing that the court will find you clear of that business but ormiston so far as i can make out was playing the fool down there for a week before polling day and there are three or four yellow dogs and red feathers only too anxious to pay back a grudge on him we'll have to fight again there's no doubt about that the only question is whether we'll ruin ormiston first or not have you seen bingham i know what bingham thinks said lorne impatiently the squire's position is a different consideration i don't see how i can 
however i'll go across to the committee room now and talk it over it is doubtful whether young murchison knew all that bingham thought bingham so seldom told it all there were matters in the back of bingham's mind that prompted him to urge the course that cruikshank had been empowered by the opposing counsel to suggest party considerations that it would serve no useful purpose to talk over with murchison bingham put it darkly when he said he had quite as much hay on his fork as he cared to tackle already implying that the defence of indiscretions on moneda was quite an unnecessary addition contingencies seemed probable arising out of the moneda charges that might affect the central organization of the party in south fox to an extent wholly out of proportion with the mere necessity of a second election bingham talked it over with horace williams and both of them with farquharson they were all there to urge the desirability of sawing off upon lorne when he found them at headquarters their most potent argument was of course the squire and the immediate dismissal that awaited him under the law if undue influence were proved against him other considerations found the newly elected member for south fox obstinate and troublesome but to that he was bound to listen and before that he finally withdrew his objections the election would come on again as happened commonly enough bingham could point to the opening in a few days of a big flour milling industry across the river which would help operations on the drill hall and the post office would be hurried on at once and the local party organization would be thoroughly overhauled bingham had good reason for believing that they could entirely regain their lost ground and at the same time dissipate the dangerous impression that south fox was being undermined their candidate gave a reluctant ear to it all and in the end agreed to everything so that chief joseph fry the white clamshell of his own lost fires was never allowed the chance of making good the election losses of that year as he had confidently expected to do when the charge came on nor was it given to any of the yellow dogs and red feathers of mr cruikshank's citation to boast at the tribal dog feasts of the future of the occasion on which they had bested de boss neither was any further part in public affairs except by way of jocular reference assigned to finnegan's cat the proceedings of the court abruptly terminated the judges reported the desirability of a second contest and the public accepted with a wink the wink in any form was hateful to lorne murchison but he had not to encounter it long the young man had changed in none of the aspects he presented to his fellow-citizens since the beginning of the campaign in the public eye he wore the same virtues as he wore the same clothes he summed up even a greater measure of success his popularity was unimpaired he went as keenly about the business of life handling its details with the same capable old drawl only his mother with the divination of mothers declared that since the night of the opera house meeting lorne had been all worked up she watched him with furtive anxious looks was solicitous about his food expressed relief when she knew him to be safely in bed and asleep he himself observed himself with discontent unable to fathom his extraordinary lapse from self-control on the night of his final address he charged it to the strain of unavoidable office work on top of the business of the campaign abused his nerves talked of a few days rest when they had settled winter he could think of nothing but the points he had forgotten when he had his great chance the flag should have come in at the end he would say to himself trying vainly to remember where it did come in he was ill-pleased with the issue of that occasion and it was small compensation to be told by stella that his speech gave her shivers up and down her back meanwhile the theory of empire coursed in his blood 
fed by the revelation of the future of his country in every newspaper by the calculated prophecies of american onlookers and by the telegrams which repeated the trumpet notes of wallingham's war upon the mandarinate of great britain it occupied him so that he began to measure and limit what he had to say about it and to probe the casual eye for sympathy before he would give an inch of rope to his enthusiasm he found it as hard as ever to understand that the public interest should be otherwise preoccupied as it plainly was that the party organ terrified of quebec should shuffle away from the subject with perfunctory and non-committal reference that among the men he met in the street nobody's blood seemed stirred whatever the day's news was from england he subscribed to the toronto post the leading organ of the tories because of its fuller reports and more sympathetic treatment of the idea due to the fact that the idea originated in a brain temporarily affiliated to the conservative party if the departure to imperial preference had any damage in it for canadian interests it would be for those which the post made its special care but the spirit of party draws the breath of expediency and the post flaunting the union jack every other day put secondary manufactures aside for future discussion and tickled the wheat growers with the two shilling advantage they were coming into at the hands of the english conservatives until liberal leaders began to be a little anxious about a possible loss of wheat growing votes it was as john murchison said a queer position for everybody concerned queer enough no doubt to admit a tory journal into the house on sufferance and as a special matter but he had a disapproving look for it as it lay on the hall floor and seldom was the first to open it nevertheless lorne found more satisfaction in talking imperialism with his father than with any one else while the practical half of john murchison was characteristically alive to the difficulties involved the sentimental half of him was ready at any time to give out cautious sparks of sympathy with the splendour of wallingham's scheme and he liked the feeling that a son of his should hark back in his allegiance to the old land there was a kind of chivalry in the placing of certain forms of beauty political honour and public devotion which blossomed best it seemed over there above the material ease and margin of the new country and even above the grand chance it offered for a man to make his mark mr murchison was susceptible to this in any one and responsive to it in his son as to the local party leaders they had little more than a shrug for the subject so far as they were concerned there was no empire and no idea wallingham might as well not have been born it seemed to lorne that they maintained toward him personally a special reticence about it reticence indeed characterized their behavior generally during the period between the abandonment of the suits and the arrangement of the second liberal convention they had little advice for him about his political attitude little advice about anything he noticed that his presence on one or two occasions seemed to embarrass them and that his arrival would sometimes have a disintegrating effect upon a group in the post office or at a street corner he added it without thinking to his general heaviness they held it a good deal against him he supposed to have reduced their proud standing majority to a beggarly two figures he didn't blame them i cannot think that the sum of these depressions alone would have been enough to overshadow so buoyant a soul as lorne murchison's the characteristics of him i have tried to convey were grafted on an excellent fund of common sense he was well aware of the proportions of things he had no despair of the idea nor would he despair should the idea etherealize and fly away neither had he for his personal honour any morbid desires toward white clamshell or finnegan's cat his luck had been a good deal better than it might have been 
he recognized that as fully as any sensible young man could and as for the great chance and the queer grip it had on him he would have argued that too if any one had approached him curiously about it there i think we might doubt his conclusions there is nothing subtler more elusive to trace than the intercurrence of the emotions politics and love are thought of at opposite poles and wallingham perhaps would have laughed to know that he owed an exalted allegiance in part to a half-broken heart yet the impulse that is beyond our calculation the thing we know potential in the blood but not to be summoned or conditioned lies always in the shadow of the ideal and who can analyze that and say of this class is the will to believe in the integrity of the beloved and false of that is the desire to lift a nation to the level of its mountain ranges both dispositions have a tendency to overwork the heart and it is easy to imagine that they might interact lorne murchison's wish which was indeed a burning longing and necessity to believe in the dora milburn of his passion had been under a strain since the night on which he brought her the pledge which she refused to wear he had been hardly conscious of it in the beginning but by constant suggestion it had grown into his knowledge and for weeks he had taken poignant account of it his election had brought him no nearer a settlement with her objection to letting the world know of their relations the immediate announcement that it was to be disputed gave dora another chance and once again postponed the assurance that he longed for with a fever which was his own condemnation of her if he could have read that sign for months he had seen so little of her had so altered his constant habit of going to the milburns that his family talked of it wondering among themselves and stella indulged in hopeful speculations they did not wonder or speculate at the milburns it was an axiom there that it is well to do nothing rashly lorne in the office on market street had been replying to mr fulk to the effect that the convention could hardly be much longer postponed but that as yet he had heard no word of the date of it when the telephone bell rang and mr farquharson's voice at the other end asked him to come over to the committee room they've decided about it now i imagine he told his senior putting on his hat and something of the wonted fighting elation came upon him as he went down the stairs he was right in his supposition they had decided about it and they were waiting in a group that made every effort to look casual to tell him when he arrived they had delegated what horace williams called the job to mr farquharson and he was actually struggling with the preliminaries of it when bingham uncomfortable under the curious quietude of the young fellow's attention burst out with the whole thing the fact is murchison you can't poll the vote there's no man in the riding we'd be better pleased to send to the house but we've got to win this election and we can't win it with you you think you can't said lorne you see old man horace williams put in you didn't get rid of that save the empire or die scheme of yours soon enough people got to think you meant something by it i shall never get rid of it lorne returned simply and the others looked at one another the popular idea seems to be said mr farquharson judicially that you would not hesitate to put canada to some material loss or at least to postpone her development in various important directions for the sake of the imperial connection wasn't that lauren asked him what six months ago you were all prepared to do oh no said bingham with the air of repudiating for everybody concerned not for a cent we were willing at one time to work it for what it was worth but it was never worth that and if you'd had a little more experience murchison 
you'd have realized it that's right lorne contributed horace williams experience that's all you want you've got everything else and a darn sight more we'll get you there all in good time but this time you want me to step down and out said lorne that's for you to say bingham told him we can nominate you again all right but we're afraid we can't get you the convention young and windle have been working like moles for the past ten days for carter interrupted lorne carter of course they nodded carter stood the admitted fact i'm sorry it's carter said lorne thoughtfully however and he dropped staring before him into silence the others eyed him from serious underhung faces horace williams with an obvious effort got up and clapped him on the shoulder brace up old chap he said you made a blame good fight for us and we'll do the same for you another day however gentlemen the young man gathered himself up to say i believe i understand the situation you are my friends and this is your advice we must save the seat i'll see carter if i can get anything out of him to make me think he'll go straight on the scheme to save the empire he smiled faintly when it comes to a vote i'll withdraw in his favor at the convention horace here will think up something for me any old lie will do i suppose in any case of course i withdraw he took up his hat and they all got up startled a little at the quick and simple close of the difficult scene they had anticipated horace williams offered his hand shake lorne he said and the other two coming nearer followed his example why yes said lorne he left them with a brief excuse and they stood together in a moment's silence three practical politicians who had delivered themselves from a dangerous network involving higher things dash these heart-to-heart -heart talks said bingham irritably it's the only thing to do but why the devil didn't he want something out of it i had that registrarship in my inside pocket if anybody likes to kick me round the room remarked horace williams with depression i have no very strong objection and now mr farquharson said with a sigh we understand it's got to be carter i suppose i'm too old a man to do jockey for a three-year-old but i own i've enjoyed the ride lorne murchison went out into the companionship of main street the new check in his fortunes hanging before him we may imagine that it hung heavily we may suppose that it cut off the view as bingham would have said he was up against it and that when one is confidently trading the straight path to accomplishment is a dazing experience he was up against it yet already he had recoiled far enough to consider it already he was adapting his heart his nerves and his future to it his heart took it greatly told him he had not yet force enough for the business he had aspired to but gave him a secret assurance another time he would find more strength and show more cunning he would not disdain the tools of diplomacy and desirability he would dream no more of short cuts in great political departures his heart bowed to its sorry education and took counsel with him bidding him be of good courage and push on he was up against it but he would get round it and there on the other side lay the same wide prospect with the idea shining high at one point he faltered but that was a matter of expediency rather than of courage he searched and selected as he went along the street among phrases that would convey his disaster to dora milburn just at that point the turning to his own office he felt it hard luck that alfred hesketh should meet and want a word with him hesketh had become tolerable only when other things were equal 
lorne had not seen him since the night of his election when his felicitations had seemed to stand for very little one way or another his manner now was more serious charged with other considerations lorne waited on the word uncomfortably putting off the necessity of coming out with his misfortune i haven't come across you murchison but you've had my sympathy i needn't say all this time a man can't go into politics with gloves on there's no doubt about that though mind you i never for a moment believed that you let yourself in personally i mean i've held you all through above the faintest suspicion have you said lorne well i suppose i ought to be grateful oh i have i assure you but give me a disputed election for the revelation of a rotten state of things eh it does show up pretty low doesn't it however upon my word i don't know whether it's any better in england at bottom we've got a lower class to deal with you know i'm beginning to have a great respect for the electorate of this country murchison not necessarily the methods but the rank and file of the people they know what they want and they're going to have it yes said lorne i guess they are and that brings me to my news old man i've given the matter a lot of time and a lot of consideration and i've decided that i can't do better than drive in a stake for myself in this new country of yours it isn't so very new lorne told him in rather dull response but i expect that's a pretty good line to take why yes first-rate as to the line hesketh went on weightily leading the way through an encumbering group of farmers at a corner i've selected that too traction engines milburn has never built them yet but he says the opportunity is ripe milburn lorne wheeled sharply my future partner he was planning extensions just as i came along a fortunate moment i hope it will prove for us both i'd like to go into it with you some time when you have leisure it's a scheme of extraordinary promise by the way there's an idea in it that ought to appeal to you driving the force that's to subdue this wilderness of yours when you've lived here for a while said lorne painfully preoccupied you'll think it quite civilized so you're going in with milburn oh i'm proud of it already i shall make a good canadian i trust and as good an imperialist he added as is consistent with the claims of my adopted country that seems to be the popular view said lorne and a very reasonable view too but i'm not going to embark on that with you old fellow you shan't draw me in i know where you are on that subject so do i i'm stranded but it's all right the subject isn't lawrence said quietly and hesketh's exclamations and inquiries brought out the morning's reverse the young englishman was cordially sorry full of concern and personal disappointment abandoning his own absorbing affairs and devoting his whole attention to the unfortunate exigency which lorne dragged out of his breast in pure manfulness to lay before him however they came to the end of it arriving at the same time at the door which led up the stairs to the office of folk warner and murchison thank you said lorne thank you oh i dare say it will come all right in the course of time you return to england i suppose or do you before you go in with milburn i sail next week said hesketh and a great relief shot into the face of his companion i have a good deal to see to over there i shan't get back much before june i fancy and i must tell you i am doing the thing very thoroughly this business of naturalizing myself i mean i am going to marry that very charming girl a great friend of yours by the way i know her to be miss milburn for accepting the strokes of fate we have curiously trivial demonstrations lorne met hesketh's eye with the steadiness of a lion's in his own the unusual thing he did was to take his hands out of his pockets and let his arms hang loosely by his side 
it was as tragic a gesture of helplessness as if he had flung them above his head dora is going to marry you i believe she will do me that honour and i consider it an honour miss milburn will compare with any english girl i ever met but i half expected you to congratulate me i know she wrote to you this morning you were one of the first i shall probably find the letter said lorne mechanically when i go home he still eyed hesketh narrowly as if he had somewhere concealed about him the explanation of this final bitter circumstance he had a desire not to leave him to stand and parley to go upstairs to the office would be to plunge into the gulf he held back from that and leaned against the door-frame crossing his arms and looking over into the market-place for subjects to postpone hesketh's departure they talked of various matters in sight hesketh showing the zest of his newly determined citizenship in every observation the extension of the electric tramway the pulling down of the old fire hall in one consciousness lorne made concise and relevant remarks in another he sat in a spinning dark world and waited for the crash it seemed to come when hesketh said preparing to go i'll tell miss milburn i saw you i suppose this change in your political prospects won't affect your professional plans in any way you'll stick on here at the bar it was the very shock of calamity and for the instant he could see nothing in the night of it but one far avenue of escape a possibility he had never thought of seriously until that moment the conception seemed to form itself on his lips to be involuntary i don't know a college friend has been pressing me for some time to join him in milwaukee he offers me plenty of work and i am thinking seriously of closing with him go over to the united states you can't mean that oh yes it's the next best thing hesketh's face assumed a gravity a look of feeling and of remonstrance he came a step nearer and put a hand on his companion's arm come now murchison he said i ask you is this a time to be thinking of chucking the empire lorne moved further into the passage with an abruptness which left his interlocutor staring he stood there for a moment in silence and then turned to mount the stair with a reply which a passing dray happily prevented from reaching hesketh's ears no damn you he said it's not i cannot let him finish on that uncontrolled phrase though it will be acknowledged that his provocation was great nor must we leave him in heavy captivity to the thought of oblivion in the unregarding welter of the near republic of plunging into more strenuous activities and abandoning his ideal in queer inverted analogy to the refuging of weak women in a convent we know that his ideal was strong enough to reassert itself under a keen irony of suggestion in the very depth of his overwhelming and the thing that could rise in him at that black moment may be trusted perhaps to reclaim his fortitude and reconsecrate his energy when these things come again into the full current of his life the illness that after two or three lagging days brought him its merciful physical distraction was laid in the general understanding at the door of his political disappointment and among a crowd of sympathizers confined to no party horace williams as his wife expressed it was pretty nearly wild during its progress the power of the press is regrettably small in such emergencies but what restoration it had horace anxiously administered the express published a daily bulletin the second election passed only half noticed by the murchison family carter very nearly re-established the liberal majority the dominion dwelt upon this repeated demonstration of the strength of reform principles in south fox 
and Mrs. Murchison said they were welcome to Carter. Many will sympathize with Mrs. Murchison at this point, I hope, and regret to abandon her in such equivocal approval of the circumstances which have arisen round her. Too anxiously occupied at home to take her share in the general pleasant sensation of Dr. Drummond's marriage, she was compelled to give it a hurried consideration and a sanction which was practically wrested from her she could not be clear as to the course of events that led to it nor entirely satisfied as she said about the ins and outs of the affair this although she felt she could be clearer and possibly had better grounds for being satisfied than other people as to edwina's simple statement that miss cameron had made a second choice of the doctor changing her mind as far as mrs murchison could see without rhyme or reason that mrs murchison took leave to find a very poor explanation edwina's own behaviour toward the rejection is one of the things which her mother declares probably truly that she never will understand to pick up a man in the actual fling of being thrown over will never in mrs murchison's eyes constitute a decorous proceeding i suppose she thinks the creature might have been made to wait at least until he had found his feet she professes to cherish no antagonism to her future son-in-law on this account although as she says it's a queer way to come into a family and she makes no secret of her belief that miss cameron showed excellent judgment in doing as she did however that far-seeing woman came to have the opportunity hesketh had sailed before lorne left his room to return in june to those privileges and prospects of citizenship which he so eminently deserves to enjoy when her brother's convalescence and departure for florida had untied her tongue stella widely proclaimed her opinion that mr hesketh's engagement to miss milburn was the most suitable thing that could be imagined or desired we know the youngest miss murchison to be inclined to impulsive views but it would be safe i think to follow her here now that the question no longer circles in the actual vortex of elgin politics mr octavius milburn's attitude toward the conditions of imperial connection has become almost as mellow as ever circumstances may arise any day however to stir up that latent bitterness which is so potential in him and then, I fear, there will be no restraining him from again attacking Wallingham in the papers. Henry Cruikshank, growing old in his eminence, and less secure, perhaps, in the increasing conflict of loud voices, of his own grasp of the ultimate best, fearing to, no doubt, the approach of that cynicism which, moral or immoral, is the real horror of age, wrote to young murchison while he was still examining the problems of the united states with the half-heart of the alien and offered him a partnership the terms were so simple and advantageous as only to be explicable on the grounds i have mentioned though no phrase suggested them in the brief formulas of the letter in which one is tempted to find the individual parallel of certain propositions of a great government also growing old the offer was accepted not without emotion and there too it would be good to trace the parallel were we permitted but for that it is too soon or perhaps it is too late here forlorn and for his country we lose the thread of destiny the shuttles fly weaving the will of the nations with a skein forever dipped again and he goes forth to his share in the task among those by whose hand and direction the pattern and the colors will be made end of chapter thirty three end of the imperialist by sarah jeanette duncan